Jack Livini, Joaquino Lauro Livini is with me today. Hello, everyone. <laughs> and Don Adriano. And today I have with me the pleasure of interviewing Joaquino Livini. Uh, like you saw, great tenor and great um, teacher also. He's, ta he's teaching right now at Curtis Institute of Music, one of the most prestigious in um, the world, really, and, and in America. He's taught big names like Michael Fabiano, Joseph Calleja, Giuseppe Filanotti, Andrew Owens, and I'm sure I'm forgetting uh, some names there for sure. <laughs> and um, he has his own, uh, he has his own uh, opera uh, festival, the Mediterranean Opera Studio that he has there in the in the summers a great program from young for young singers all, all ages of singers but singers looking to get better and to get the best uh, uh, teaching he invites there so many wonderful people Kamal Khan Salvatore Fisichella Neri Milichoy I mean many many great names and many great people and great singers so um so yes without further ado I guess it's time to say hi to Jack Hello, how are you, Don Adriano? What's up, Jack? How... It's a pleasure, it's a pleasure to be with you this uh, evening. Thanks well, so much. Thanks so much for uh, for the interview. I mean, amazing that you can you can um, be uh, with us today. You know, in under uh, these uh, uh, weird conditions, still. <laughs> yes, a little bit strange. <laughs> People don't know, but Don Adriano himself is a really good tenor. And I first met him years ago when he applied for Mediterranean Opera Studio and won our scholarship for that year as a, as a tenor. And so, thank you for that, Jack. Honestly, yeah. I, we never talk about that, but that was a real, that was a real um, uh, co uh, like confirmation for me of my talent because I, I as you as you know, I, I was a baritone before. Uh, so many years ago, I cannot even believe right now that I was a baritone anymore. And uh, and uh, I wasn't sure, you know, uh, schools, uh, sometimes they're hard on people. And, uh, you know, I, I wasn't uh, I wasn't getting so many compliments. And when I got that scholarship, it was kind of a confirmation for me, you know, like uh, if a guy like Jack Livigny that sings so great and and all these uh, tenors even going there, students that I felt like, wow, they're awesome, too. Uh, you know, if, there was there was kind of a, a big a big thing for me at that point. So, so exactly. thanks a lot. Huh? Yes, absolutely, you deserved it. And it <laughs> wasn't just me; it was our whole panel. So Nelly Mirichoyu, who is like a, a great diva, Salvatore Fisichella. You know, all these people <laughs> were all uh, all d'accord. We were all together in, in deciding on on you as a as a great talent. So great, and, and uh, I remember that 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 uh, Fisichella that year. Yeah, uh, you know how serious he is, and he. Um, I remember singing the. I sing uh, some Neapolitan song in the concert, and he was looking at at everybody with his, you know, his intense eyes, and he pointed at me. You, <laughs> I cantato bene. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if I, 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 think I was like, oh my god, like. <laughs> That's good. I mean, good I, I still there. remember so strongly that uh, uh, that uh, Fisichella that year, particularly because it was my first time that I saw him. You know, right? Yeah. I, 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 by the way, if anybody can go and 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 see him, uh, I don't know if he's going to be there this next summer for for Mediterranean Opera Studio. So you know, if we if we can find a solution to to our COVID problem, we definitely will be there. So. So oh, I highly you. recommend, I mean, that oh, he, if you haven't heard a tenor before here in Fisichella, I mean, mm. it's, it's really an experience. I mean, not, not to put anybody down, but really like, it's incredible. <laughs> link to the past. Yeah, yeah, a link to the past. Yeah, Jack. So, um, 
so uh, yeah let's let's start with that actually it, um since you're mentioning the link to the past how you what is the role of Fisichella in your in your in your career and in your singing how how you got into contact with him right well he is now my my principal mentor for myself oh, as okay a um And uh, I met Salvatore, well, I, I remember as a child seeing Fisichella in Palermo. I lived in, in Palermo, Sicily, and my dad took me to see Il Pirata, Bellini's opera Pirata. And I just remember this little guy on stage just emitting these high Ds. And I was like so overwhelmed by, by you know, the amazing things I was hearing. You know, you, you listen to these things on recordings, and, but when you see them live, it's really something else. And so it was a really special experience. And, and a couple years later, I was a, uh, a finalist in the uh, International Bellini competition that's held in Sicily. And he was on the, on the panel of the jury. And, uh, you know, after we, we finished, I, I didn't win the competition, but I got a recognition and so forth. He pulled me aside. I had sung arias from Bellini's Puritani and Pirata. He pulled me aside and he said, Livigni. I can't tell Ben, you sang well, but this is not for you. He's like, this, ah. these operas are not for you. This is the type of opera that you need a tenor that falls out of bed and sings a high D without any, without thinking about yeah. it, without problems, without fear, nothing. Right. And he was right. And he said, you're, you're not that kind of tenor. You can sing the high note, but if you're going to do a steady dose of this night after night, year after year, this is not right for your voice. And he was the first person that, that told me that because I was going to school at the Academy of Vocal Arts and that's what I was getting. I was getting this kind of high uh, stuff as repertoire. And his suggestion was to just stick to the more lyrical things like Elisir d'Amore, Lucia. Mm. And I took that to heart and he was right. It was much better for my voice to stay with the lyric things, not this high flying stratospheric stuff. And so then after a few years later, Um, I met him a few times more, um, and then eventually I got in contact with him when I started doing Mediterranean Opera Studio. The first year, I thought immediately, okay, I'm doing this in Sicily. There's no way I'm doing this in Sicily and not involving yeah, Salvatore in this, right? So we got on a bus from Palermo. We drove three hours to Catania, and we went to his house, and we had that first masterclass. That, you know, the video with him working with Andrew Owens has become like, I don't know how many hits that thing. I, have, I think it's the really video, mo the most popular uh, opera video on YouTube or something right. like that. It's something crazy. Like that. It's got like over a million hits or something. It's crazy. And that was the first time that we, we went to Salvatore as a mentor for Mediterranean Opera Studio and Festival. And it was a, a great experience to meet him again. And we've been in, in contact. And, you know, whenever I have a question or something about my voice, I go to Salvatore. You know, every singer needs somebody to hear them because yes. we don't hear what we need. And we need somebody that knows what they're hearing. And Salvatore knows what he's hearing. <laughs> so, you know, I take my cues from him and I listen to what he does. And, and it is quite extraordinary for a tenor to stand next to him and to kind of sense what's coming out of his throat. Right. Yeah. And to look at him. When, while he's doing that, you, you, you kind of get this sense of empathy uh, for the voice itself, right? And it kind of almost you absorb it by osmosis. It's, it's, it's a really extraordinary experience. And so, you know, I'll do, he'll, he'll sing something and I'll sing right after him trying to do what he's doing. And a lot of times it just works. <laughs> I don't know why, but it does. And, it, and it's just extraordinary. I think this is the way, you know, it used to work also in the old school. Uh, people would do something to explain, okay, this is what I'm doing. You listen and then you imitate or you try to do follow the same process. And oftentimes the impression, the oral impression of what you're hearing from him impacts you and your mind. And you are able to then, you, you know, you try to make the same noise basically that he's making and it works. Mm. You have the impression of sound and that's maybe the most important technical thing that a singer needs like the the correct idea the correct intention of sound he gives you that and then when you try to imitate it you're that much ahead of the game because it's an immediate thing you know but you I also have like as a model you also have your uh, another salvatore which uh, your dad 
Yes. With, it's a great tenor too. Absolutely. So I guess, so I guess uh, those those two figures together. I mean, it's uh, yeah. I would say a big influence, no? Absolutely. I mean, my dad was a uh, was a dramatic tenor. It was different than myself. I am, I am, I can feel the similarity between me and Salvatore. I could not feel that with my dad. <laughs> he was like a he was like a baritone with high D's. Oh my crazy. god! So it was a whole the totally different kind of of voice. I still have that imprint in my head, and uh, in my head, I'm always like a dramatic tenor, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing I can do about that. Uh, but you know, I do have that imprint, and and you know, for many years, from when I was like 17 until he passed away um, in my early 20s, you know, it, um, he was my my principal mentor before I moved to the United States. So. Yeah. So, so um, I don't want to jump too much ahead, but when you, when you're saying um, that the imprint of the voice, uh, in that sense, uh, would it make more sense for a tenor to study with another tenor than, and and then the same with sopranos and the same with mezzos? Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, uh, it it just depends. You know, every every person is different. I don't know that there is a cookie cutter decision about that. I mean, could there be benefits? for a tenor, you know, studying with another tenor to try to get a feel for the voice. Yeah, definitely. That mm. could very well work, but it's not essential. There are many, there are many singers that have come out of studios of different voice types. I mean, I can think of Margaret Harshaw or, you know, uh, e even like Cotogni. Cotogni was uh, one of the greatest bar Verdi baritones, but he produced so many tenors. It's true, yeah. Gee, Laudi Volpi. He he knew the principles of how to phonate, and that goes across the board for all voice types. And if the teacher has an ear for understanding the sounds, then it's easy for them to teach other voice types because they recognize the sound, they know the principles to correct the sounds, and so it becomes very easy for the teacher to guide the student. What's lacking there is the teacher saying, "Do it like this." Because a soprano can't tell a tenor do it like this because she'll, you know, there's nothing. Anyway, it's so so separate. Right? Well, but at least it sounds so so different, you know. Exactly. But yeah. she can tell a tenor these are the principles. This is the process. Do that. If it gets it wrong, she can nudge him in direction. Salvatore Fisichella was taught by Maria Gentile in Catania. She was a famous Italian coloratura soprano. So and he it's, he did yeah. pretty well in yeah. learning technique from her. And, and there are many other, uh, you know, examples of that. There are even many examples of teachers that can't sing at all. You know, like Ettore Campogagliani was a great Italian teacher. He taught Freni, Pavarotti, a whole slew, Bergonzi, uh, many, many singers. He couldn't sing worth anything. I don't even know if he was a comprimario. I don't think he had a comprimario, oh, no. but he knew the voice, he knew the process, And he could teach. And there are many teachers that are like that, that they they can't really sing well, but they can teach. So, you know, there's a there's a, that philosophy. Oh, that teacher can't sing. Yeah. He must not be good. I've, oh, I've heard that a lot. Yeah. And, and and people throw this toward me and say, you're a good teacher because you can sing. And I'm like, you know what? Actually, <laughs> there are many great teachers that can't sing. And there are many good singers that can't teach. <laughs> So that you know, thank you for the compliment, but I don't know that that necessarily applies. You know. Yeah. So so tell me, actually, well, your your first goal. Uh, I mean, in, I guess right now you're you're more um, a, a teacher than a performer uh, for I don't know for the last 10 years or something like that. I guess. And and so, but why 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 was that? Why your first goal was to be a performer? I guess, and then you you switched. Uh, more towards teaching and and can you explain this transition and how yeah. how you had yeah. to adapt maybe yeah absolutely i mean i i was basically singing full time up until about 2008 um uh, 2009 and had had you know already done some prestigious houses around the world including the met and other places um but I was not getting the kind of traction that would allow me like to travel around with my family uh, and have the nannies and stuff like that, like other people. Uh, and we had difficulties, you know, in our in our home with 
children with disabilities. And so, you know, it was, it was a little bit difficult to actually have a career where the family was traveling with you. So it becomes a little bit difficult when you're out eight months during the year. Um, if kids need a stable environment and you're, tra you're transporting them from place to place, that doesn't work. So mm -hmm. we kind of figured out early that I would have to be traveling on my own. Um, and that worked for a good five, six years after we figured it out. Um, but there came a time where, you know, I, I felt uneasy, quite frankly, mm. with, with what I was putting into the career and what I was getting back from the career. Um, you know, you have to make a choice at some point. People think, you know, you're singing, you're singing at the Met, you're singing at Marseille, you're singing, you know, in Frankfurt or all these places. You must be doing okay. Well, not always, actually. And nowadays with COVID, forget it. It's like a disaster, right? But a lot of times you can you can make more at a day job than you would being an opera singer at an A house. Because after you figure commissions, taxes, you know, half goes away in taxes a lot of times when you're singing in Europe. Then 10% goes to your, your agent. Another big chunk goes for your living expenses in the place because you have to take care of that. Yeah. Right. And so then what, what you're left with is not, a, you know, a, an enormous amount, uh, as you would think. Oh, yeah, he's making like eight, ten thousand euros per night for a show. But what actually is actually coming to you is far different. Yeah. That, right. So, you know, you have to evaluate as a performer what you're comfortable with, with your family, you know, uh, what the, the level of sacrifice that's required of you. Um, as an individual and for your family to support you going out for that time, you have to be at peace with that sacrifice and feel okay with it. And a lot of people are fine. And a lot of people don't have families. You know, they choose to not have families exactly because they know what's involved in, in this kind of career. And so they make decisions early on. Um, some have families and they, they juggle things around and it's very difficult you know, for them, but they manage to do it. And depending where you are in, in the level of singer, um, how much you're getting actually, and how much work you're getting and so forth, you can make things work. We didn't, it didn't work really well for us. And on one occasion I was in Frankfurt and I was doing Cenerentola and during my aria, at the end of the aria, I jump off this chair and I have to sprint after Cenerentola and I tore my Achilles tendon as I went, ah, it just snapped completely, right? And so I'm looking down at my shoe, like, did I, did I lose my heel? What happened? Because my, my, my foot was falling. Oh, like, and, oh, yeah. And so then I saw the heel was there and I went to run again and it was gone. It was, there was no way to leave. Ah, my my leg. Yeah. So I walk off stage and by the time I get off stage, my leg is completely numb. Uh, disaster. I still went on with crutches because in Cenerentola, the scene is that as you're chasing after her, your carriage flips over and then you it flips over because, uh, uh, you know, it just happened. The, the, the architect of all this makes it flip over right in front of her house. And so I go so, in with crutches because it fit the scene, you know, yeah, yeah. finish the show, you know. The, and then after I finished, I went to the hospital and I went to the hospital by myself in a cab. Hmm. I had a lot of friends. And this is not to badmouth anybody. No, no, it's like that. It's like that. They were all gone. It was just me. And everybody knew that I was hurt. And I, I got myself into a cab. Nobody from the theater accompanied me. And I go to the, and I have surgery. And I was there for a week. And there were a few people that came and visited me. It was great. But it's one of those realizations that you come to that realistically, you go and you meet a lot of people. You work with a lot of people in this business. But that's just friends in the moment, right? It's different than your family. Your family, if you're hurt, will come anywhere they need to, to rescue you, to succor you, right? I didn't have that. And that was, that was not something that I felt good about. And I got home. I was, it just happened to be that then my, my surgical wound wasn't affected with a resistant bacteria. So I was actually in bed for six months trying to 
beat this infection that I oh. got you know, from this surgical wound in Germany. And so, you know, six months I was out. And then I had to literally make a decision. What am I going to do now? Am I going to actually go back and start auditioning and so, so, so forth? And, and I just decided with my wife, you know what? I'm not doing that anymore. I went back to school. I got a degree in business. I, uh, I, I started. I didn't teaching. know this. Yeah, I started teaching then about a year later because I always liked teaching. This was like something that I, I felt passionate about. Even when I was in school, I would sit down with people and I would talk about the voice and and I would blog about the voice and all these crazy things. And people come to me sometimes with books of things that they've gathered, of things that I've wrote, you know, written online. I'm like, are you crazy? Why are you, why are you gathering? <laughs> I thought I was intense. Please burn that. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, and I started teaching and I loved teaching and I felt really comfortable and I understood what was going on in people's voices. And I, and I, I, I think I had a good talent with it and from the results and from what people were, were expressing to me. And I just continued. And I, ever since then, that's what I've been doing. And I have felt quite frankly, more at ease and at peace and at harmony with myself as a teacher than I ever did as a performer. You know, even when I sang in big houses, it was like, yeah, oh, wow. You know, I remember walking around as a student around the Met and thinking, oh, I'm going to get there someday. And then when I sang, I'm like, okay, eh. that's fine. <laughs> that was nice. It didn't do anything for me in that sense. You know, I, not, that to, not to say that the Met is not a great, a great house. No, not at all. And, and not to minimize anyone's achievement in reaching that, that goal. But for me, as an individual, it didn't it didn't do anything for me, really. And and so I had to find something that I was at peace with. And my mom always used to tell me this. She says, be careful the ladder that you climb, because you might get to the top of the ladder and find out you leaned it against the wrong wall. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Very wise woman, very yeah. spiritual and wise woman. And she's right. You have to know what you want what you are in harmony with. Sometimes we think that an opera career is what we will be in harmony with, but we don't know that until we actually do it. We have a mental image of what an opera career is, but we don't know the level of sacrifice and the, the, how much it's a mind game until we're in that. Some people are good at that and have good voices and they make it. Some people are very bad at that and even when they have good voices, they don't make it. You know, and some people, oh, they didn't make it. They didn't have the voice. No, they might have had the voice, but there's much more that's needed to be an opera singer. These people are like really intense in their minds. They are focused. You know, if you want to get something done, ask an opera singer. <laughs> I'm serious because they, they are just at the top of multitasking and getting things done, organizational skills and knowing how to deal with people and all these things that are so important in any aspect of business or of enterprise, an opera singer excels at those things. You know? and, and what you mean is um, opera singers nowadays, I guess, because I, I, well, I can think of uh, many uh, characters really of opera that, uh, I don't think uh, nowadays maybe it wouldn't work, you know, like I, I think of uh, Franco Corelli or I think of uh, Bonisoli. Uh, I don't know uh, if they would have uh, stood the, the, the way the career is done now, you know? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Y y y who knows? I mean, those were monsters, vocal monsters, yes. right? Yes. And yes. so uh, when you have a talent of that kind, you just get out of their way as an organizer. You're like, I do whatever you want, Mr. Corelli. You can have stage fright all you want. I'm going to put 50 people here backstage to help you. And as long as you go out on that stage, that's all we care about. You know, yeah. there are sacred monsters of that kind when it comes to opera. And he was definitely, you know, one of them. So you, I don't, you never know. You never know. Mm. So, uh, so Jack, going back to that, uh, I don't know if you if you noticed, but um, um, three weeks ago or a month ago, I don't know how much ago, we, I did a program uh, on the on the top ten tenors, top ten tenors of the of the history of opera. Okay. Uh, 
after the recording because I'm not going to judge somebody that, you know, I, I don't have any any guide, you know, for hearing them. So um so I I guess my question is um do do you can you share with us some of your ten tenors? I I guess this uh, you know this is not a, a set in stone type of exercise, but I think it's good just to you know just to educate some some people that might know sure. not know of some tenors, and also just to get a perspective of what your tastes are in terms yeah. of so, yeah. yeah. I mean, I have in my head I have categories of tenors, so I don't have okay. one top tenor and say oh this is. You know, maybe if I were to have to choose one great tenor. Of no, well, ten, ten. Ten, yes. Yeah, yeah, top if ten. I was a, a top one, I probably would go with Caruso just because he was such an innovator when it came to vocalism, you know, and, and the just the voice was just so extraordinary. But like, if, for example, if I'm thinking, so he's, he's one of mine. Okay. If I think like top technician, I probably would go with Lauri Volpi just because what he could do was just extraordinary. He could sing high, he could sing low. His voice was wider than anybody else's. I mean, you can hear him doing Trovatore with Maria Callas. And during the Miserere scene where she's on stage and he's backstage, he's singing and he's towering <laughs> over her. And you're like, okay, this was a huge voice. And that's just mother nature, right? But then the technique was there to fortify that ability. So it's just an extraordinary instrument and an extraordinary technician. So he's one person, maybe not the most beautiful voice, but an extraordinary technician. So those are two. I love Ji Yi because Ji Yi is one of the most beautiful singers, you know, uh, and a beautiful voice uh, and technically also incredible. Maybe not as extended as Lauri Volpi. Yeah, yeah. Both the high notes. Yeah. Cool, but, uh, you know, really, really incredible incredible singer um i i i love burling it's just the, the quality of the sound the, the freedom uh the, the boyish quality a real tenor mm. you know that silver non-stop sunshine in the voice right so he's another one di stefano for me is at the t at the top when it comes to beauty of tone I mean, we listened to those 1940, what, nine or 48 recordings from, from uh, Lausanne, I think, in, in, uh, in Switzerland when he was military. He's 22 years old or 23. Yeah. Unbelievable. My dad would have me listen to those recordings day and night. I could listen to nothing else. I had to listen to that. He wanted that sound to be imprinted on my brain, yeah. and it still is. I mean, I can hear. And your dad as a that's that's particular to me because I mean that your dad uh, as a dramatic tenor, which is uh, Di Stefano, is not well. He is, but he's not. Uh, no, like, he's not. Yeah, he's not really dramatic tenor, but he had a big voice. Right? No, no, I mean, dram yeah, I mean, I mean, get, I guess because I guess I, uh, I I guess dramatic also comes from the able to uh, portray drama, like Di Stefano is capable. Bravo. Yes. That's right. Yeah. My dad said the same thing. He said there was a difference between tenore drammatico and tenore lirico spinto. Lirico spinto was a, a voice, a huge voice that had spinto qualities, but a dramatic was someone that had l'accento drammatico, right? That could actually phrase something with great drama. Yeah. Right. So even a lighter tenor could be a dramatic tenor for my dad. And I agree with him. Nowadays, the Fox system is totally different. To be a dramatic tenor, you have to be like some baritenor. <laughs> and you might not have one ounce of dramatic accent in your voice, right? So for me, that's a spinto tenor. It's not a dramatic tenor because right. I, I think of it differently because of how my dad taught me. Yeah. Right? But you're right. I agree with you that the dramatic tenor is all about la cento, the way that you phrase things with a certain passion, a certain drama. And I mean, that's, because yeah. uh, think of the Stefan Lucia. Lucia is a very, oh. uh, it's very dramatic. I mean, yeah, one of the most dramatic, I would yeah. say. And yeah. he, I cannot find somebody that has the drama better than the Stefano. That's right. That, one. that last scene. Oh, <gasps> those recordings with Carlos. Yes, I mean, my girlfriend always cries on it. Tears your heart to pieces yeah. and yes. stomps on it. Yes. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. He touched, and so does she. I mean, that duo was <laughs> mind-blowing. Yeah, yes. the, the, the level of 
human truth communicated through their voices is just a revelation. That's what opera really is about. It's not about who has the biggest voice or who has the most squillo. It's about the ability to communicate. And that transcends even technique. See, Di Stefano had a great technique, really, he did. But he did some things in the passaggio and the upper voice that put him in danger. He opened a lot, right? And so he had a lot of... La Politano, not, yeah. Right, he did not turn the voice properly and so forth. But he had incredible control. And his ability to express was so off the charts that nobody cared. And rightly so, because that's what opera is about. It's about really transcending that stage and communicating human truth. What is that character really going through? Can you help the audience feel through empathy, through your voice, what that is all about? And when and people know, you know, when they feel it, they applaud, they know that it's great. And there can be the singer in the halls, oh, but that was that was so open. <laughs> That note was not turn right. Just jealous. There's, there's no speed note in that sound. And they're right. They're right. But they missed everything that opera is about. And so this is, you know, me as a teacher, I tell people this. My dad used to tell me this as well. Io ti posso dare una voce, ma se sai cantare, son cavoli tuoi. I can give you a voice, but if you can sing, that's your business. You know, the teacher can teach you how to sing a little bit, but you have to have it in your own soul. Mm. You have to be able to dig down deep into your own soul to communicate. These communicative skills are not something that are, that is easily taught. Coaches try, voice teachers try, but it's got to be the creativity that's inherent in the singer's mind and heart to be able to get you there, to be a great singer, at least. Mm. You know? So Jack, uh, uh, now you bring this question, um, can anybody sing if they come to you? Have, have you ever encountered somebody that you can you say, look, I j this this is not possible. You know, I cannot, uh, you, you I, just I, can't sing. Yeah, like, I, I have, is that I, possible? Yeah, yeah, uh, well, yes, I, I have, I, I, as a, as a rule, I don't close my door to anybody. So if somebody comes to me and they are not the great singer, I try to carve out time for people that are at the beginning. I don't only teach people that are already made. There are some teachers that they only accept people that are like already great singers. And then they yeah. take me to their studio, eh, they present them, look how great my singer is. <laughs> that happens all the time and that's okay. Uh, I try to carve out time for people that are at the beginning and you never know. You know, how is it going to turn out? Some people have more talent than than others, naturally. Some people, not as much, but they can surprise you. You know, can anyone become a singer? Yes. Can anyone become an opera singer? No. To be an opera singer is a whole different ballgame. It's the, the natural selection involved is incredible. And it sometimes it goes even beyond the voice. You people can have an amazing voice and not be fit for an opera career. And that's a whole different ballgame. Yeah, like get too sick and stuff like that. Yeah, right. Yeah, for example. Yeah. yeah. Um, the biggest thing that I have closed my door to and say no is intonation. I can't teach somebody to be intonato, to be in tune. In, huh. I, I, I can't. I just can't do that. I, I, I don't know how. I don't know if anybody can. Some people say, yeah, it's possible. You can train ear... I would never do it. And the simple reason is this. You can do that and try for a period and you teach them how to sing and you, maybe you go f four or five years of training. They become technically really proficient. They go to an audition and it's like... Uh... <laughs> This has happened to me. Oh. Literally, I, I stand at the piano. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, and it's... Questo, quello, per me, but... To completely off key and and to sing exactly correctly but on a different key completely and uh, like the whole area yes and they <gasps> they don't hear it they're following the correct intervals just in a different tonality 
you know, and that, that happens. And when things like that happen, I just close my piano and I say, <laughs> I, I recognize you might have a voice and stuff, but not for opera because you might learn for four or five years and make all these sacrifices, which are enormous. Nobody understands, you know, because you're a singer, you know, the sacrifices that are involved. It's not just the lessons, it's the time, the tears. I mean, you really, an opera singer puts their mind 24 seven into learning music, learning languages, uh, perfecting their technique, listening to old recordings. I mean, it really envelops our whole existence in many ways, right? And then you do that for four or five years, not to mention, you know, the monetary sacrifice. And then you get in front of an audition panel and you're like, da 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 questo quella. You see what I'm saying? They'll, they'll, they will send you away and they will never look at you again. They will write you off forever. They will never allow you to come back for an audition. And so, you know, yeah, that's, sad. that's a really, really big risk to say, oh, well, that person can learn how to sing in pitch. No, and uh, they might. Just, just to just to clarify, Jack, that's not it's not the same as saying like, ah, oh, I'm a bit uh, a bit flat on this note or no, that's or, different. Uh, yeah, that's different. There are people that sing completely well, and then at certain passages they might go flat. That's a different thing altogether. You know, this the mind can only track so many things, right? And there are many things involved in producing tones. This particularly is true in the passaggio. Uh, you know, sometimes in high notes, but mostly in the passaggio, where the balance between chest voice and head voice can be a little bit difficult to navigate. Mm -hmm. And they might go a little bit flat or sharp, depending on how they're approaching it, right? And they might not realize it in the moment. Usually it's because the pitch is somewhere within the oscillation of the vibrato, right? Our ear knows as a listener if it's dead center or if it's like, like, If uh, you're doing, uh, I don't know. If it goes a little bit. Right? It's a little bit under. As a singer, you might not hear that if the vibrato is encapsulating the pitch center. Why? Because the brain only tracks so many things. Right? So as a teacher, I always tell people, you must plug in pitch center as an essential element of your technique. You cannot build your voice without thinking of the pitch center as part of the equation. Sometimes people just give it for granted, you know, and so they might sing perfectly well and then they go flat on a passaggio note and they're like, I can't believe that I'm listening to this recording. I thought I was right on and I was like really flat or really sharp. Right. And it's just a matter of figuring out whether or not you can track a lot of things mentally at the same time, you know, and pitch has to be really important with that. So that, yes, there are many singers that can, are perfectly, their, their ear is perfect, but when they're singing, their attention might suffer for a moment in certain areas, and they might go off without realizing it, notwithstanding the greatness of their ear. And that happens all the time. You know, even great singers sometimes are a little bit off. Yeah, you know? you, it happens. Yeah. It's not because they, they, if you ask them to hum it, there's no way they're going flat or sharp. It's when they have to do the 20 mm. different things that are involved in opera technique, that that can happen because what are you going to track first, right? Mm. Building a cohesive technique where all the elements are streamlined down to one or two things is a process that takes years. Yeah. All the various elements can be you know, shrunk down to, to a few intentions, the sound, you know, the color, um, the emotion you can you can bring all the elements down to a few and it can work but it takes years to build that kind of intentionality you know mm. so jack um before we continue i uh, i just wanted to say uh, hi to everybody uh, that is in the chat right now of uh, of la cena musicale uh, listening to this so um yeah, and 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 also you know if you have some questions 
I'll try to bring them up here, see um, see if Jack uh, feels like answering and can answer them. Uh, so, um, yeah, right now I see uh, Kyla, Rachel, Kelsey, uh, well, Vivian is there. Hello, hello. Valerie hey, Poisson. <laughs> Valerie Poisson, Olo Deler. Um, uh, who else is there? I can see here. Yes, Kyla. I don't know if I mentioned, but anyways, uh, thanks so much for uh, for tuning in. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, like I said, uh, bring them up. I think I think I have one here. Uh, if you don't mind. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I think this is a really interesting one, actually. By um, this is Valerie Poisson, Jack, uh, that asked mm -hmm. this. It's a soprano, a very good soprano here from Montreal. And um, her question is, if I like to share emotions with the public, not to just give uh, my love of singing, how can we do this now via internet? How can, can, how can she connect in a deeper way in a virtual environment? That's a good question. That's kind of unexplored in many ways, right? We're... we're we have out of necessity been trying to figure out what our art form will be looking like in the short term and hopefully not in the long term because op obviously opera is something that is experienced in the theater. Um, and it's difficult. That's, that's a different, difficult question, Valerie, because, you know, our, our art form is such that you as, as the singer on stage, or in many ways, like a sculptor, you use your voice to create a sculpture of harmonics that expand in the theater. It's like literally a living sculpture of sound. And the people in the opera house are hearing you. They're breathing the air that you are vibrating. And they can feel on their skin the emotion that you are putting in to your singing, communicating these words, the meaning behind this, of the emotion, of the life experience of these characters, of what you are living as an artist. This is something very deep. You know, the, the, the artist has a really sacred experience for me as an opera singer. I think an opera singer, when they're at the top of their game, they can really be an oracle, a, a living instrument to reveal what it means to be a human being. We get so caught up with so many things about our life and, and the hectic everyday business of our life that sometimes we need to just sit back and allow the emotions of what it means to be a human being wash over us. And opera gives us that opportunity between the singer and the orchestra to really feel on our skin this emotion, this power. Um, and it communicates to this ancestral brain, to something that's really deep inside of us. And it helps us to open up and to, to discover sometimes feelings that might have been dormant for some time. So it's, it's a very special and sacred experience for me to, to be an opera singer in the opera house, because it's different when you're there in the opera house. Now, with COVID and the reality of our situation, of course, over the internet, it's the same, uh, you know, it's the same art that you're transmitting, but it might not have the same impact as it would in an opera studio. So I would say, if you are going to try to be that artist that communicates and that shares those emotions, make sure that you have a very good sound system, a good microphone, a high bit rate upload speed in your internet, something that you can transmit, you know, at a high rate so that it has a certain quality. Make sure that, you know, the, the, the sound uh, is such that, you know, your, your microphone systems can, can uh, pick it up and not clip and not distort, you know, all the, the more fidelity you can put into your sound, uh, that you transmit over the internet, the better it is for the experience. Because all these small nuances that are 
very evident in the opera space can often be cut by speaker systems that kind of normalize sound and transmit compressed stuff. So it becomes a little bit more complicated for the listener to, to really experience things as you would. But if you start from the premise of getting the best equipment that you can, um, and then, you know, a, a coupling that with some high definition video, um, it might be the case where you would actually pre-record this so that you're not having to stream live just because it can cut on the quality of the sound, yeah. right? So you might want to like consider doing a live recording where you're actually singing live, but it's recorded. Then you can upload the whole thing and without the problems of streaming and allow the, the listener to download it at high speed and it will give a better, a better uh, sound quality. And I would say, you know, it's different when you you have a camera in your face than on stage. Stage is different. Your gestures have to be so big because you have to be able to communicate, you know, people that are sometimes 50, 60, 100 meters away from you, right? So you have this big space and your gestures have to be big enough to be able to uh, give the impressions. When you're in a camera, you know, on camera, it's it's different. You know, it's 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 green acting, as opposed as opposed to theatrical acting, right? So even small things, small facial expressions can can go far. So you know, as a singer, knowing that that's going to be your your um, uh, your your show, your gig is to transmit something screen. You should study in front of a mirror your expressions and the way you feel, you know, about a certain phrase, look in the mirror to see if your expression actually confirms, right? What you're it's feeling. Yeah. These are, yeah, they, they might, these things might seem like, okay, that, but that's a little bit, uh, you know, you, you're, you're, you're imposing too much on, you know, that's really acting. It's not spontaneous enough. Actually, no, you know, sometimes we, we want to express something in a certain way, but our face doesn't show it. If you're on stage, you can get away with it because your gesture is different. <laughs> but if you're on a screen, it can be very different. You know, you have to be able to do certain things when you're on a screen that you wouldn't do in an opera house. The, the nuances are, are different. So it's a really different ball game, I think. Um, so, yeah, you know, definitely. Yeah, yeah, different ways of, of, of treating it. But those are some ideas that, that might allow you to express more organically as an artist. Mm. Me, I'm, I'm, I, I have to say from my, from my point of view, I'm, I'm very pessimistic. I'm sorry about that, but I'm very pessimistic about doing any sort of opera online. Like I just, I, that's, I don't, I don't even understand why would you be singing that loud, you know, if, uh, if you have a microphone, you know, and you can just <laughs> already <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, it goes, point? it goes against, uh, you know, like, uh, what naturally is and, and so I mean that's just my my take on it, but mm. I would say uh, you know maybe maybe actually doing a great recording is a good uh, right now it's a it's, maybe it's a good time for that you know yeah for, for you like, know, a, uh, a couple months back um, the Met did um, a concert where they they had a series of stars uh, coming from their from their living rooms right I, I saw that yeah of my own that that that, that were on that show right. Um, Renee Fleming, her setup was better than everyone else's. She, you could sense that there was more space in the sound. She had a setup that really picked up the sound differently than everyone else's. Some people, like, it seemed like they were, like, singing with their smartphone. I'm like, really? What's going on here? <laughs> you could have put this as the Met. You could have put a little bit more thought into this, right? Uh, or it could be that just, you know, the quality of the upload speed was terrible. I mean, unless you have files. No, oh, there's so you many things. You can't upload fast enough, right? Cable, yeah. terrible. The bit rate for upload is terrible. Yes. You know? So you can't get high fidelity unless you have fiber optic wire as uh, as your carrier for internet, right? Mm. Um, so, but it, it just goes to show, she put a lot of thought into how she would bring her sound. And it really was a different experience to hear her. I mean, she's always an amazing artist. I mean, she, she really communicates incredibly but 
It was different to hear that complexity of sound with a good system compared to others where it was kind of choppy and and a little bit, you know, the audio would cut. It really yeah. distracted from the experience. No, well, I think I think at the beginning too, uh, it's, it was also the novelty of ah oh, and the and the the surprise the the, the home effect like ah uh, oh, this is so cozy. This guy is in the, his house and. And but I mean at one point if you really evaluate uh, the the sound and the image it's yeah. not I mean it's not as great I mean yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and quite frankly I mean mic singing is very different than than um, you know than than live ah yes no it's, if uh, you're singing for a mic yeah it's different. When you have a hundred piece orchestra slamming you in the face with sound, <laughs> it's very different than knowing that that mic is right there and it's picking up and you could do all kinds of small nuances that you would not be able to necessarily do, Yeah, uh, you know, in, in the theater, depending on the orchestra, you know, depending on, on how sensitive the orchestra is to, you know, there yeah. are other factors in live singing compared to when you're mic'd. But you see, that's where I find the interesting thing about the microphone and and about the doing the live stream and whatever you want to do like that uh, with with technology is the fact that uh, to use that instead to use the mic as a weapon or use the mic as an instrument, just like uh, Bocelli does. I mean, Bocelli he has some sort of opera voice, but but really his his talent is that he's able to to uh, to really uh, give you more than than that to go into this little type of voices that uh that i mean that work with the with with what you got you know like that, yeah. that's what yeah. i say work with what you got you got a microphone well why don't you maybe uh, i i feel like it's great to make your sound uh sound uh, sometimes uh, like if you're gonna do baritone areas for example and you're a tenor if you sing really close It starts picking up the <laughs> yeah. the lower frequencies. I mean, there's some experimentations like that. I feel uh, interesting, you know. But I mean, yes, it's not it's not opera. Right. But uh, I mean, just just my two yeah, cents no, no, there. The, the level of the level of uh, let me say appoggio, the level of compression of the sound onto the breath column that opera singers that sing with resonance, with great resonance, the, the type of compression that they have. It's not mic singing. It's theatrical singing. I mean, if you get up close to someone like Piotr Bechawa or, you know, Mike Fabiano, Joey Kalea, you know, these people up close, they're kind of, uh, uh, yeah. it's a little bit too much. You know, they're very loud, very, very, very loud singers, you know, and that the level of compression in the harmonic energy of the sound is theatrical. Hmm. It's not made for being mic'd. They can do it. They do it. In fact, they record it and, and they, they, they make beautiful recordings. That's because there's some very talented sound engineers that go into that, right? But yeah. that's not how they were trained. They were trained to do these things in the theater. So their voices are built to maximize the power of the resonance, you know, right. which is different than, you know, Bocelli, who grew as a mic singer. And so when you take away the mic, you can't hear him. He's not. He knows all the tricks too. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, uh, um, Jack, I wanted to go back with the question. We, you gave me some of your top ten tenors. I didn't hear the names. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed. I, I didn't hear the names of Pavarotti or yeah, Corelli. Wait, 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 wait. I only gave you five. <laughs> I didn't get to ten. You're going to. <laughs> Pavarotti would definitely be on my list simply because he was a an opera machine nobody has even come close to the kind of consistency that pavarotti had throughout his career i mean you can listen to a record of pavarotti and then you listen to the live recording and it's the same <laughs> and that tells you something about the exactness of the mental intention of the technical ability you know to sing at all times in one way, it's not random. Even within the context of expressivity, where sometimes your creativity may bring you in certain directions or other, he was always a type of singer that let his creativity fall within the parameters of his technique. You know? So for that reason, and of course for the beauty and, and the just the, the pure joy that his voice gives, 
I mean, th does anybody not smile when listening to Pavarotti? You've got to have something wrong with you. If you, <laughs> if you don't smile listening to that sunny voice, I mean, it just it just fills your heart, you know? It's a great singer. And of course, Corelli would be there just for animal passion that voice evokes in, in the listener. It's just extraordinary. And and the the torrent of sound. You know, these might not necessarily be my models in terms of technical modeling what i would what i would uh, you know try to emulate yeah you know? uh, salvatore fisichella is someone that i would try to emulate i would not try to emulate corelli because that's much more of a unique approach non-traditional as much as people would like to think that corelli was a traditional singer corelli was far from a traditional singer you know? <laughs> and he his physique was far also from from the traditional tenor too like Absolutely. If, he, if I look yeah. at him at the street, I say he's a, a either a baritone or a bass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, agree. Because I mean, big larynx, like larynx, uh, long tenors long. have mainly small vocal cords, thinner than the right. Right. than right. a big guy like that. You know, right. like, when you hear, I don't know, even basketball players. I I I say this because I love basketball. So I even have their voices in my head, like Shaquille O'Neal. He his voice is like this. Is like, uh -huh. I mean, the guy is huge, and I, yeah. I, I think there's a correlation there with the size of a vocal cord. I find that to be the case. It's very surprising for me. I mean, I look at people sometimes, I say, oh, that's a baritone, because I see the prominent larynx, the long neck, and then they have a tenor voice. I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. You know, and there are some, like Jonas Kaufmann. Yes, so that's a good example. James yeah. Valenti is one of them. I, I was at school James with Valenti, and I, yeah. I always, okay, wow, that's such a long neck such a tall person, you know, you think, okay, that's got to be like a baritone, baritone sound, but then they are tenors. You yeah. know? It, it's never a hundred percent, but the likelihood you're right. A tenor is usually not that kind of physique, not the Corelli type physique. No, no. And, yeah. and that's what is uh, so special about him too. You know, like uh, sure. in, in roles like Alaf, I mean, the Prince and the, yeah. this guy shows up and like, what? Yeah. <laughs> No, my dad used to tell me this. He used to tell us this story all the time. He said he was in Rome and he was he saw Callas with uh, with Corelli in Norma, and so he said Corelli was like a Greek god. He wore these these the this short mini skirt with this with this huge <laughs> breastplate, and he's walking on stage showing his legs, and he looked like a giant, right? And then out comes Callas, and she's got her drape with her. And she's like, in mi amor, al fin to say. And he, my dad says he shrunk. All of a sudden, Corelli was like, <laughs> <laughs> she was just larger than life. I mean, she wasn't a small person, but she wasn't Corelli, you know, no, uh, yeah. a petite figure. But her presence, the magnetism of her presence would cause other people to like kind of shrink. It's very interesting, you know, mm. to say, why am I saying that? Because sometimes you might not be the tallest person on stage, but you can be very magnetic with the way, like Mariela de Villa, for example, tiny, I mean, literally, <laughs> right? I stood next to her and she's like this big. <laughs> but when she's singing on stage, everybody's looking only at her, right? There's this magnetism that, that happens there. Nelly. Nelly Mirichoyu. Yes. He's the same. Very magnetic people on stage. There's a certain quality. It's but not also, I mean, the, the intensity in Nelly's uh, eyes is like... Is uh, yes, like, yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's talent. Mm. It's a sacred fire that some people <laughs> have and other people don't. And it's a God-given yeah. gift. You can't do anything about that. You can't teach that. You can't learn that. It's a gift. You know, you might acquire. I don't know. God gives gifts sometimes, even when you don't have it to start with, and then all of a sudden you have it. I don't know how it works. I'm not uh, the one to say. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know how it works. I don't know. But yeah. some people, they just have that. And, you know, have I ever seen anybody that did not have it to start with, and then all of a sudden they had it? I can't mm, think of anybody, no. but it could be. I'm not one to say it's impossible, but the likelihood is that this is a given gift from the beginning that you have or you don't, you know, mm -hmm. even when you don't know how to sing, you might, you might know what you would do if your voice would let you. And so then your, your quest for technique is to learn how to liberate what you would want to do. I felt this way. 
But the only problem was that in my head, I was a dramatic tenor. <laughs> <laughs> because I would hear my dad. So for me, I know exactly how Turido or Canio uh, or Otello, I know exactly the way they should sound, right? The only thing is that even if I had the technique, I couldn't sing the roles because my voice was not right for it, you know? Where but but your dad was trying to... Uh, who wants to sing Barbieri Sevilla? I may be blasphemer. I don't know. People, oh, Bobby is so important, so sacred. I'm like, I've done it so many times. I can't stand the opera. And that's not because I don't love Rossini. It's just it never did anything for me. Cenerentola, on the other side, I had tons of fun. But I, I don't know. But Barbieri, I mean, the, the, the tenor is, is should be really call, uh, oh, called Alma Viva instead of... A fantastic uh, role. Yeah, it it's is. Fantastic yeah. role. It's just, I just could not. I couldn't... <laughs> I don't know what it was. It's just Drinkly. something about the role I could not relate to, and other people do. And that's, you know, that's just character, I think. It's because I have the dramatic tenor in my head, that's why. And yeah. So people was like, ah, I don't know, maybe. So, uh, Jack, so uh, I had a question about, um, we were talking about the uh, singers, and, you know, always the all singers come back, you know. They, they are like... Uh, ghost that is yep. haunting us <laughs> in our dreams so i i, I guess um, you know i i'm pretty sure you're aware of uh, the opera circles where the greatest singers were in the past and right now uh, there's not so many great singers do you agree with this kind of no. thought no i don't i think the people that push these kinds of narratives online hate opera i'm one of those people that i think if i could ban People like these on This Is Opera and these kinds of channels that promote, oh, let me post this singer at their worst. They, oh, they had a night where they cracked. Of course, they don't, they don't, they don't show the hundreds of nights where they were perfect. They'll go and find the, the clip where they're at the worst. And then they'll say, oh, look how bad opera is today. These people don't go to the opera. I know this because I've actually communicated with some of these people. I said, how many times have you gone to the opera this year? Oh, I don't go to the opera. Wait, why do you love opera? Do you love opera? What exactly is going on here? They don't go to the opera. They don't like modern singing for some reason. When I can tell you, I think modern singers are probably some of the most polished singers ever. I really believe this. I listen to recordings from from the past, and there are those that are really incredible. Rosa Poncel, <laughs> you know, Caruso, Gigli, you know, but then there are so many that might be good technically, but they're not better than Bechawa. They're not better than, you know, uh, Ruczynski or, you know, other other people out there. They're not technically. And they weren't that great as expression either. And so that's probably why they're not famous. But everybody's, oh, that singer was great. Listen to this. Well, yeah, but listen to this guy. I mean, there, there are people like Juan Diego Flores. Juan Diego Flores does things that are pretty amazing. I don't think there's ever been a Rossini tenor like the ones that we have today. We have like a series of Rossini tenors that are just absolutely incredible, you know? And, and, and lyric tenors. I mean... You listen to some lyric tenors today. Like, for example, we, we, we lament, you know, beautiful voices like Di Stefano. Where's the voice? Well, I'm sorry. Joseph Calea, Michael Fabiano. These people have beautiful timbres. Just incredible color in the voice that you, you're like, my goodness, that is such an amazing sound. You listen to someone like Callas. Well, you know what? I've been backstage when Joseph Kalea has been doing Norma and I'm listening to Sandra Rovanovsky on stage wow, she's and I'm incredible. thinking, oh my goodness, this is like, this is unbelievable. You think, okay, from a technical point of view or from an expressive point of view, the way that the voice opens up, this is great singing. She can hold her own with anybody from the past. I agree. Who are these president. people that say that opera is no longer, but you know what? It was like that a hundred years ago. <laughs> There were people a hundred years ago. I was like, "Oh, Laudi Volpi, he stinks." I had Dupre in my days. Or... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes. There's always people that have something negative to say, and it's because they don't really love opera. They're not there to listen. I can go to an opera. I can go to a, a performance of Butterfly, where the 
where the performer is okay, but they can express, I'll walk away crying because I feel what they're trying to do. I sense the music and it overwhelms me because I, I feel what was what the creativity that's going into that, the emotion. I'm not going to get stuck over some technical aspect. That's crazy talk. That's not opera. But, but where you you think that this come from? The, the this uh... I, I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist. <laughs> and I think that people that do these things need one. Uh, quite frankly, uh, I don't know. Is it envy? Is it is it bitterness because they didn't make it into? I mean, there are all kinds of theories. People say, oh, they, they didn't make it an opera, so now they hate all opera singers that have made it, or they have some grudge against opera, or. Who knows? I have no idea. Some of these people are not even opera singers. They never even studied in their life, but they think they know everything about opera and technique. And so they criticize opera singers today, but they don't go to the opera. Yeah, They're not that's... patrons of the opera. They don't spend a dime on investing in opera in any way, shape or form, except listening to old recordings and then criticizing a, a modern opera singer. I'm sorry. That's not what opera is about. Opera is about going to the theater and allowing yourself to open your heart and your mind to listening to what the composer and the librettist have created and what the artist in that moment is able to give you in terms of their creativity and their heart and let that wash over you and change you. If you're not able to be changed, then you probably are not really for opera. Opera lovers are people that allow themselves to be moved that don't go to the theater cold and walk away cold. They go to allow the emotion to wash over them and to make their life a little bit better. That's a kind of hopeful opera lover that would never participate in these uh, online things of, oh, that, that singer sucks, blah, blah, blah. Never, they would never do that. That's not why they go to the opera. That's what we need. If we allow these channels to thrive because we go to them and we, we are the patrons of these channels, we are doing an immense disservice to opera. We have to ban these, these channels from our consciousness. We love opera, so we will not allow ourselves to be influenced by these negative people. That's not what opera is about. We yeah, are it's dangerous because I mean, they do have a, a big, big following. Yeah, like, a lot of people uh, talking about this. Does. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's uh, this negativity is uh, can can become really strong. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. No, Alan is here. <laughs> Hi, Alan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 Jack. So I um, I wanted to um, to ask you about high notes because I I mean that's okay. that's your. Uh, That's uh, the tenor whisperer that, that comes there. <laughs> so uh, let's start with something, uh, a very easy premise, um, which is the high C. Yep. When people say, um, I have, uh, do you have, uh, do you have the do di petto or the chest high C? Yep. Uh, what do you think about that? And, and what actually happens when uh, we hear a free and resonant high C? Is it, is it because the, peop the person is really bringing the chest up there to the high C and that's where the power and then and the explosion comes from? Mm -hmm. And in general, I guess we can apply it down to B flat uh, and then the high notes, basically. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, the, 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 the tessitura, the, the way that the range works in a tenor voice, um, there are different types of tenor, right? There are some tenors that by nature are very extended. And from the very beginning of their studies, they have high C's, high D's and so forth. And then there are other tenors that at the beginning of their studies, their voices like finish at F sharp. And then they build note by note, right? So there, there are many types of different voices when it comes to that but you know the the, the idea of do di petto is kind of a misleading uh, label because it kind of implies that you're going with the full weight of the middle voice all the way up to the high c right people that that actually bring a lot of chest voice or weight 
into the passaggio and above are usually tenors that have limited extension, the so-called binatural tenors. For example, Richard Tucker, Mario del Monaco, even to an extent, Corelli. You know, he was initially a B-natural tenor, and then through his work with Lauri Volpi, he acquired a little bit more extension as he brought in a little bit more what he called sweetness, the lighter mechanism into the voice. But other people, like Pertile, also a B-natural tenor. Gigli himself was... These people, like, if they had the option to lower the, the, the testitura of the aria from a C to a B-natural, they would do it, because it would be easier. For many ways, even Pavarotti... You know, the king of the high sea, labeled by Decca and, and <laughs> Breslin and all this. Yes, the king of the high sea. But later in his career, if he could avoid singing high sea, he would definitely do that. Just because when you are a theatrical singer and you're really up against a huge orchestration that a lot of these operas like Puccini operas and, and you know, uh, heavier Verdi, uh, or, or, never, or never mind even the Germanic rep. You know, when you have a thick orchestra, you tend to be a little bit more uh, loud in the middle and the passaggio, which is where you mainly sing. And so the consequence of that is that you, you're, you're not quite able to lighten the registration as you go higher. And so that puts you at a limit as far as, high, as, as far as how high you can go. And a lot of these tenors became B-natural tenors because of that. They could have scaled down the middle and the passaggio, as Lauri Volpi suggested. Like, he would always say, a tenor is a tenor. A baritone is a baritone. He criticized Caruso because Caruso's middle was gonfiato, inflated, and much, much more bombastic. So it, mm, it yeah. resulted in a passaggio that was much more powerful and carrying a lot more chest, but limited the ability to sing high, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there are some recordings of Caruso singing like Maggie Chetona, uh, you know, some some places where he goes up to high seas, but they're kind of wamist. They're not full voice. Right? Yes, yes. These are like a B natural tenor, really, even Caruso. And it's because the impact of that verismo repertoire on the voice was that. It, mm -hmm. it gonfiare il centro, you, you fatten the middle which lowers your tessitura and doesn't allow you easily to go up. There are, there have been tenors in the past and in the present that were loud by nature, really loud, and were able to sing gently and sweet in the middle. And so they didn't have to really pump hard against the voice to sing loud in those areas, and they can go up to high seas. Modern tenor, Marcello Giordani, comes to mind. The man could sing a high D flat or a high D or an easy high C and yet could hold his own with any orchestra, right? Bless his soul. He's now passed on. But there are others, you know, that, that have this kind of volume as well. Piotr Bechawa is one of these. He has a very present sound, very vibrant and very present. Fabiano the same. He can't be covered. Uh, Kaufmann has a bigger middle but the, the volume is not necessarily the biggest volume that you've heard in the upper house. When he goes up, oftentimes oh, the orchestra is too thick for him, notwithstanding the operas that he does, like Otello and stuff like that. You know, they, every voice is different. And a lot of times it depends on, on the orchestration that you, that you have, that you sing constantly up against as to how it influences your voice, you know, and, and being able to learn the extension. So people that have you know, that build their voice to go up, typically sing repertoire that is not too thick. They sing Donizetti, <clears throat> they sing Bellini, they sing Rossini. Um, they might sing some Puccini, but not as a steady diet. You know, they, they'll sing like the younger Verde, they'll sing Rigoletto, they'll sing Lucia di Lammermoor, you know, uh, that, that kind of repertoire that does not necessarily have a constant thick sound it doesn't have like four horns blasting the same note that you're singing you know and that you're competing with the horn that has a very similar eerily similar timbre to the tenor voice you know not you're trying to get over them and like gunning it to kind of get you know if you have a big voice then it just goes but you know having squillo having resonance does not necessarily mean that you're loud you might have resonance and still not be loud enough 
for those things, mm. you know, for those revenue. And there are tenors that have paid the price. I mean, I can think of a few that, you know, sang the lyric repertoire to start. They did their traviatas, they did their bohems, they did rigolettos and all this stuff, Lucia. And then their agents pushed for bigger repertoire and they started doing Don Carlos and, and Balu y Mascara. And then it just happens to be, ah, they hemorrhage the vocal cord, their career is over. Uh, agent moves on to somebody else. Next. You know, that, that's what happens in, in the business. It's because you have to know who you are vocally. It's not just about whether or not you have a dark voice. A dramatic tenor or a spinto tenor is not just a dark voice. It's a loud voice. It's a voice that can get over that thick orchestration. You might have a very loud. Sorry to interrupt you, yeah. Jack, but that loudness, it doesn't necessarily depends on the, the technique. It's no. not because oh, no, 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 he's no. not singing in chest enough or no, that's crazy or... talk. Okay. It's never that. It's never that. It's about the balance of, of in singing. These people that have huge voices, they sing correctly, but they're loud, louder than others, right? I can tell, like Marco Berti, a friend of mine, he's, I could not believe what came out of his throat when I first met him at the Met. It was gargantuan. I'd never heard a B flat that loud in Butterfly. It was, the, you know, the Met is a hard house to fill. His voice was like, it was like spinning in that opera house. And that's a huge opera house. Nobody fills the Met. You know, it's very rare that people actually fill the Met, right? He was one of those that was able to, to, to do that, right? And it's yet, if you listen to him, he sounds like a lyric tenor. You know, he did a, a, one of the Met concerts that from, from your living room. He sang... Uh, the, 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 the duet from uh, El Isir d'Amore, right? And he sounded perfect for the role. You would have thought, oh, yeah, he sings El Isir d'Amore. Yeah, but when you hear him in, as Radames and he's towering over orchestra and every other singer, you realize why he sings that repertoire. It's not just about color. It's also about power. And that's a gift. That's, that's, your vocal cords are such that they are... Uh, a certain configuration, a certain thickness, and so forth, that you're able to produce that kind of power. And that, yes, it's technical, but it's not just technique. It's, it's the regular technique that everyone else uses, just with the added bonus of being a very big voice by nature. Yeah. Right? Laudi Volpi was one of the biggest voices ever as a tenor. This, everybody says this. Corelli says this, Bergonzi says this, all these people that heard him live... They all said it. He was a huge voice. But his whole premise of singing was to sing dolce in the middle, to be as light as you could so that then you could blossom in the top, right? And his light in the middle was louder than everybody else. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's an intention to go up to the high C or the higher register. You have to have in the range, like from C to A flat, a, an ability to sing... Uh, gentile on 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 the sweetness of the sound where you're not involving too much muscle in the chord right so that when you go up your vocal cords are longer they are still adducted they have the ability to harness this breath energy and can go up to these higher notes in this lighter mechanism and harness all the power of the high voice you know you listen to someone like Lauri Volpi or Fisichella mm -hmm. for example Fis you know you've heard them live The voice on the high register is crazy. Oh. It's huge, right? It's Giordani. I remember singing with Giordani in a three tenor concert, and we did the La Donna Mobile together. And at the end, uh, pensier, pensier, we did it uh, in three. First he would start, then I would go, and then Richard Troxel would go. And it was yeah, like, Troxel, oh, right? <laughs> the three of us. And what happened? In the rehearsal, he starts, bands, yeah, and he was right next to me, and it was like an avalanche. I actually turned around and went, and I didn't start singing because I was so overwhelmed by, <laughs> forgot. by the sound. Like an explosion of harmonics, crazy, crazy loud, to the point that when you listen to him in an opera house, the voice would like, it would spin loud in the opera house on those high notes, right? But his, the way that he produced those sounds was the same 
as Fisichella. They had the same teacher, Maria Gentile, on that lightness. Really? Okay. Great adduction. Great so adduction. So how... Uh, 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 how the the tenor or or even the other type of should be feeling in the throat at that point what's how the would you feeling in the muscles is that your vocal cords are in a position of closure where they're harnessing the breath in a very gentle way ah! it's as a certain closure that they have and then you have to have enough just enough chest mechanism, so enough thickness in the cord, just enough to initiate a chest voice. That's not because a high C is not falsetto, but it's close. It's very close in terms of how light it feels inside. But the, the engagement with the breath is very different. When you, when you switch from like falsetto to full voice in the high C, you sense the body compress the air, right? It compresses the air underneath the cords in a different way. But as far as your cords know, they're still working in a very light way. It's just that now all of a sudden this air is being harnessed by this very efficient um, sound at the source and it liberates an enormous amount of energy, sound energy, but you don't feel push here. You feel in the body an engagement. It's like when you, for example, if you sing in falsetto and you go, ah, 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 you click into voice. It's the same idea if you go from a falsetto ah, and then you click into full high C. It's the same kind of click that you initiate a little bit of contraction in the muscles, the vocalis muscle in the cords to initiate just a little bit of thickness just enough to power up the sound. If you put too much, it actually diminishes the volume. So all if these- If you put too much chest for My chest. Yeah. This is what people that hear loud singers, you know, you, you see these ridiculous clips on YouTube where they're like that you hear this loud tenor on a high note and then they'll put like a little caption that says full chest. Those are people that never sang. They have no idea what they're talking about. They think what they're hearing is chest voice because of the ring. Well, the ring it sounds really strong. It doesn't sound right. like falsetto. The ring in the sound is generated by the chord closure and by the epiglottic lowering that tunes the harmonics in a very specific way to give you that band of frequency that's very exact. But it's not chest voice. It's enough chest voice to actually power up the sound, but just enough. The feeling for the tenor is actually a feeling of lightness, morbidezza. People ask Corelli, what, what do you feel when you sing your high notes? What's the effort? And great singers are great singing. He says, oh, it's similar to when I speak. <laughs> right? So think of how you speak. Does that cost you? I mean, uh, if you speak like... Well, it depends. Yeah, exactly. Right? That's what but I was going to say. If you speak with a gentle flow, right, in the right pitch the optimal pitch level for your voice, your voice produces naturally a sense of resonance. That effort is what you would feel on a high note. Actually, I, I, I love that you bring this point, uh, Jack, because have you noticed that this, again, I go with the singer of the past, but he seems to really be part of the education. When you hear a Gilly or when you hear a Laudi Volpi talk, they really have another way of talking that then, yes. then even the, Tenors like Pavarotti, like I hear Pavarotti, and I like na 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 na. He's really like, and and the other one is really like, uh, I don't know. There's something like, like this. Sort of boyish. <laughs> yeah, you know, if you go to a speech therapist, a speech therapist can help you identify the pitch level where your voice is most resonant. I have I have talks like this with my students. Like I had last week a tenor who came to a lesson and he started talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm talking. Hello, how are you today? Oh I'm like, okay. <laughs> do you talk a lot when you're like, do you work? Do you do something when you talk a lot? And and he's like, no, not really. But I, so I said, do you when you talk a lot, can you sing after? He says, I have a hard time. So I said, okay, well, instead of talking down here, why don't you talk up here? Talk up here and let me see what your voice sounds like at this higher pitch level. All of a sudden the resonance opened up without even trying. You know, 
often what what people do is they start placing the voice. So to to speak in a more operatic way, they'll start talking like this, and now all of a sudden the voice is full of this ring and blah blah blah, and they're using the epiglottis and all this stuff. It, it's completely unnecessary. That's not needed to save your voice. Actually, you just I think you're just tiring yourself out. <laughs> if you just identify the correct pitch level at which your voice resonates most freely, that's the level where you should speak. We just have so many cultural things like everyone at my house would speak low so i speak low because that's how everybody speaks that way but if i pick up my pitch level a little bit now all of a sudden my voice is a little bit more resonant and present without me even trying and now i can speak for a longer time without getting fatigued just because i'm speaking at a higher pitch level the speech therapist can often help with that for people that have difficulty transitioning from speaking to to singing you know and you hear someone like domingo speaks at a really optimal pitched level oh, yeah, he's... He's... del monaco del monaco parlava così molto alto <laughs> it was like it was it was a really high pitched the point's like wow i wasn't expecting that i was expecting to hear this from del monaco and he instead spoke like this very much high pitched it's like almost comical Sometimes. No, the Monaco particular, yes. But it was powerful. Even in the speaking voice, it was like... It's yeah, well, the, there's voice. this, uh, this laryngeal type of, uh, uh, yes, type exactly. of thing. It's just bigger, I don't know what it is. If it's thicker chords, if it's bigger chords, longer chords. I, I don't think it's longer. It's probably just thicker by nature. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? A, a doctor would tell you what, what, what makes loudness in terms of what to look at in a vocal cord. In terms of loudness, it's probably the thicker edge that produces more harmonics, I would assume. A tenor is just a complicated voice because you have to learn how to like mitigate the effect of that thickness by lengthening the chords and, and figuring out how to tilt the larynx so that you can get a longer chord and all that stuff. So it's very complicated for a tenor. But one thing is for sure, you don't go up to a high C in full chest because if you do, it'll be this big. In order for the why voice, is that how does that make because sense because it's wrong if you go up with full chest your cord is thick so the contact edge between the two cords is so so thick that the air pressure that's required to open and close the cords is enormous compared to when the cords are thinner uh, well, so only, what what if you would just uh, send more air then right well that's the only thing you can do you can push the air But you know what happens? You'll sing for a year and mm. then you won't sing anymore. Yeah. <laughs> That's not what the spinto tenors that are famous have done. Del Monaco could sing horribly the whole aria and then get to the high note and boom. And he'll hold it for like 15 seconds on the blade of singing, right? Of a thin mechanism right on the squillo lightening up them and you can hear it he lightens it and he goes right to the squillo and you see him he's going ah! he lifts that lip you know he's tuning higher harmonics you know that this is a lighter mechanism that he taps his energy into for that high note right it's not full chest is it influenced by the by how he sang in the middle yes in fact he was a b natural tenor mm. so it, it's always thicker Del Monaco and Spinto tenors that sing that way are thicker in their vocal cords. They have more chest than a tenor that sings high, but they don't go to high Cs. They go to B naturals or B flats. Yeah, or at tenors least not as often. High yeah. Cs or C sharps are tenors that learn how to sing between C and A flat in a thinner, more gentle way so that they can extend the vocal cord and go to higher ranges. And they are much more powerful on their high notes than they are in the middle. Where someone like Del Monaco, often you can hear that it's very big in the middle and it's relatively big the same way when he goes up. It's not gigantically different. Hmm. Where you listen to someone like Lauri Volpi, in the middle voice, it sounds very light and gentile. And then when he goes up to the high note, it's like an explosion of sound. Yeah, it's a different way of thinking of the voice. We say, aprire a ventaglio. You open yeah. the voice like a fan. The higher you go, the louder it gets. That does not happen if you carry chest all the way. Your voice goes like this if you carry chest all mm. the way. Yeah, and so, it's so a question actually about the one was just just because it's a good example. 
Del Monaco. What if Del Monaco tried to do it the Lauri, uh, Lauri Volpi did. way? Do you think he would have had uh, some level of success still? He did. In the beginning, Del Monaco sang in a more traditional way, and by all accounts, he had up until an E flat extension. But the voice was much smaller. And then when he studied with Melocchi, Melocchi really mm -hmm. amplified the width of the C to F range and then carried that width over into the passaggio up until A flat. And then Del Monaco knew how to imbloccare l'acuto. He knew how to get to the high note and really lock himself into that more uh, squillante position, you know, better than any other student of Melocchi, you know. He knew how to go to that traditional place. And so he, he's kind of a nice hybrid. You know, other Melocchi singers were not as adept as Del Monaco in getting to that focused uh, uh, high note. What is, what is uh, the other, Campo, Campo, which one is? There's one that's it's pretty good too. It sounds very similar to Del Monaco. Uh, Limarilli, is it Limarilli? Limarilli, yeah, he wasn't as famous. He was not as powerful hmm. as Del Monaco. Uh, he had some squillo, not, not excessively squillante like Del Monaco. He was a little bit wider. Ah, okay, yeah. You know, um, Del Monaco was much more of a blade on his high voice, like a trumpet. Yeah, much more traditional, like you would listen to someone like Lauri Volpi. You know, so, it's more uh, squillante, more yeah. focused. Yeah. So, so you're saying basically that Monaco, the 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 success he had is basically because he he was able to kind of come from a lighter place from the to start with. Yes, and absolutely. then. And then add weight with the Monaco, with the Meloki technique. Yes, right? absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You can hear it. You can hear the switch at A natural in Del Monaco's voice where he goes more toward the squillo and abandons the weight. And, you know, in his journals, he talks about how he would do like a steady diet of three months vocalizing on U, which was the typical method Meloki had. I know yeah. because my dad studied with Meloki. He had this... this position and then he would do three months eh, exclusively to find the squillo so he would switch U, eh, those two poles cavita that deeper u laryngeal mm. position and the eh, to get that higher tongue and that more powerful adduction that gives you the higher harmonics right so he he knew exactly how to fuse those two elements It's interesting, these hybrids that came out of the school, like Del Monaco, even Corelli. Corelli is not a traditional Melocchi singer. No. Any stretch. Yeah, he studied that method, but he modified it. He, he used a more traditional approach to approach the top, thanks to Lauri Volpi. Mm. Right? So it's, it's interesting. The great singers that have done well with the Melocchi method are ones that were able to, that knew how to switch to uh, the more traditional method up top. For example, Giacomini. Giacomini, before he studied with Marcello del Monaco, studied with Vladimiro Badiali, with my dad in Milano, right? Badiali was a, he was a teacher of uh, Aragal, uh, 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 the baritone, uh, the Italian baritone, uh, the one that had the car accident. Uh, I, I can't remember right now off the top of my head. The, the incredible breath. He's known for his incredible bread. I can't remember right now off the top of my head. I don't know why I can't remember his name, but one of the greatest Italian baritones of all times, you know, um, Bastianini. No, no, no. After uh -huh. uh, more modern, much more modern. Uh, never mind. He also studied with Badiali, Vladimir Badiali in Milano. So, and at the time, Giacomini sounded like a lyric tenor. Uh, and then with, with uh, Marcello del Monaco, uh, he, he, found a little bit more of that cavita and more baritonal quality. But when he went up, you can hear it. It's like he gets this, ah, and then he, ah. he immediately goes to this smaller mouth position and more squillante, you know, in the high notes. It's, it's an interesting switch that he, that he uh, was able to accomplish. And, and often that is the case, I found, with the, the people that go the Meloki route that are most successful are the ones that before going that route knew how to sing high because of another teacher. And then they switched to a more aggressive baritoner, but were able to fuse what they had before with what came after, you know, mm. it's just, just a thought for people that might be 
kind of thinking of that route. I would yeah. I never teach people to go right off the bat. Okay, this is the Meloki method. Let's go this way. No, because you you have to learn the tradition of how to register the voice correctly and lightly. And then if you're going to exaggerate in the middle and get more beefy there, you can kind of you have a greater freedom to navigate and to do something that's healthy rather than going right off the bat in that heavy way and never learning how to navigate the top. Usually it just ends up being a monochromatic voice that can't do any dynamic whatsoever. And, you know, even even Kaufman, you listen to Kaufman's recordings from when he was young and he's like, yeah, very light. Oh, yeah. It's just very light, yeah. right? And then he studied with, I don't remember his name, some American guy in Italy, and he learned. And now he does pretty much what a Malocchi singer would do in terms of the cavita, and he's able, at the same time, still to navigate the higher register in a slightly lighter way mm. than what a Malocchi singer normally would. And he's able to do dynamics like no Malocchi yeah, singer crazy, can. Yeah. The only one that ever came close was actually Corelli, of all the Malocchi people, to be able to do dynamics. Nobody else could. I can't. Giacomini. Giacomini could do a good messa di voce. Um, he could start piano and then swell the sound, but he couldn't really bring it back. He could just do the crescendo, you know, uh, but not bringing it back to piano. Kaufmann could do both. He could yes. swell and bring it yeah. back. He's really adept and really good at that. Yeah. When you mention cavita, is, is, is that, is that uh, equivalent to low larynx or is something else? Yeah, well, look, cavita is is what we, you know, in Italian tradition, we call certain timbre qualities mm. that relate to the lower harmonics of the voice, right? So it's the type of harmonics that typically we feel more vertically, like the fundamental, the first and the second and the third harmonics, uh, uh, fun, um, overtones, are the ones that we feel usually more in this area, more vertical. Mm -hmm. um, palatal and so forth. So, and they, they have the quality of being a little bit more stereophonic, right? So they, they sound like they're coming from around, you know, in the opera house. Often mm -hmm. you'll, you'll hear people that are very good. They know how to engage those stereophonic harmonics and the higher ones. So they're, they, you know, the higher harmonics sound very directional. So you get the squealer ah! that comes directly at you from the singer on stage where the, the lower harmonics feel like they're coming from around. So sometimes you get the experience when you have a really good singer, you hear the voice coming at you from the stage, and then you hear as though somebody's singing from behind you. And you're like, where's the crazy person singing behind me? <laughs> you know, in the upper house. Because it's very disoriented. I've experienced this uh, with, uh, with Sondra Ravalowski. Yeah, problem. Yes. It, it was exactly so like what you're saying. Oh, so have I? Yes. It's it, the, the higher harmonics, which he has plenty of, come directly at you from the stage. But then the, the, these lower harmonics, they are really stereophonic and, and surround sound. And they seem to come from everywhere. So it's very disorienting and exciting for the listener. It's a very alien feeling. Uh, yeah, it yeah. feels like it's a, a god, really. <laughs> That's how it feels like, oh, this uh, uh, god descended from the sky and sang this yeah. note. Yeah, and that's why sometimes <laughs> they must be miked because I hear the sound from behind. Yes. Actually, no, it's not because they're miked. It's because of those, that cavita, those, those more cavernous cavita is, is, is a, not cavita is like a cave. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's that spaciousness, that sense of width in the sound, you know, and, and in the good singers, you hear the cavita with the squillo. So you have the lower harmonics and the higher harmonics in a balance. So you have both the, the surround and the directionality in the sound. Yeah. Is, is that cavita available for um, for lighter voices? Yes, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. And it should be. Mm. It should be very much available for all singers. If a singer is too forward with their sound, usually it's a very small sound in the opera house, even when they're, they think they're dramatic singers. And they sing very forward. Then they get on stage like, "What just happened? What happened to that person's voice?" <laughs> you know, it's like it disappeared. I've had this experience. You know, uh, at the Met, you you sometimes you 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 cover people or you walk into rehearsals and uh, and you hear a voice like, "Wow, that voice is so huge!" And you get on stage and like, "What just happened?" <laughs> 
you know, the voice phone, because it's skewed. This is particularly true for tenors because it's skewed toward the higher harmonics. So if the voice is all squillo and all the energy goes into that, but very little into the cavita, you get a very directional sound, but it's small in the opera house. It arrives, it gets everywhere, but the information coming to you is small. It's like a reed. Everybody can hear it, but it's not the whole voice. It's just an overtone. Where when they have that squillo with the surround sound, we get a whole different impression of the sound. That's why it's so important to find the cavita. And that's a technical thing that for a tenor is very much centered around what you do from C to F. That tilt in the larynx that has to be engaged in, at that point lengthens the vocal cords and enhances the lower harmonics, the cavita. You know, and allows the voice to open up differently. I remember as a young singer, I once went to a competition and Gianni Daimondi, who was a great Italian oh, tenor, love he was his voice. one of my judges, and he, he pulled me over at the end. I did well in the competition, but he pulled me over and he goes, Rivini, canti tutto, nye, 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 nye. You sing all, nye, 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 nye. <laughs> because my voice was so forward and I did not have enough of that cavita. And it was because I was not able yet at the time to figure out how to tilt the larynx, how to keep it low, it would always rise. And so as a consequence, because I did not have that tilt, all the harmonics were skewed toward the forward. And so it made the, the voice more in the, in the house. I could go up, but it didn't matter. So the cavita, you, know, because... I could, you could describe it a little bit like the, the, um, the baima, the, uh, how you call that? The... Yeah, the sense of, oh, uh, this. Yeah, this like a yawn. Thing. Like a yawn, yeah, yawn. exactly. Yes, right. it's the same position of a yawn, right? So if you think, oh, as opposed to, ah, oh, it's a much longer vocal cord. You can actually yeah. see the larynx tilt forward or you can feel it. You know, and this is male and female. You can see a great video of Carlos singing Casta Diva 1958 live Eurovision up close, black and white, and you see her larynx pop out every time she starts singing. Then yeah. she breathes and it goes back in. And then she starts singing, and the larynx goes boop, out the neck, like a little alien. Bing. You know, so, uh, Jack, a little bit of a question, an ignorant yeah. question for my part. Um, are sopranos really singing in falsetto? Like when I sing, Is that what a soprano is doing equivalently? They're singing, they're singing in head voice. So the, the level of the level of vocalis action is greatly reduced compared to a tenor or a bar or a male voice. So for them, like if they're going that for us is a falsetto. Yes. But that's because it's up there. If you do that, instead of here. You do it here. It's nothing. <laughs> Because it's a, it's a register that's foreign to that pitch range. If a soprano does what she does on a D5, on a D4, the voice is empty. Yes. And they'll go, oh. And then they'll go up and, oh. Yeah. Right? It's empty. If they don't ignite a little bit more chest mechanism on the bottom or in the mid range, their voice empties out if they bring down the head voice too far, right? So there, there's always a combination of efforts going on, but by and large, the level of vocalis activity in the female voice is far less than in the male voice. They mm -hmm. have much more below F, like, Yeah, F4. If they sing below that in chest voice, the, the, the vocalist becomes more active. Mm. Between F and C, if they are old school sopranos, they would sing much more mixed. Oh! Right up until like C. And then at C, you would hear them go. Oh! And they would go more into that head voice. Uh, excuse my, my terrible no, impression I mean, of sopranos. Soprano. But yeah. the idea of registration was such that, that you know you, you would bring chest mix in the mid range from like F4 to C5 and then from C5 upward you would switch to a much fuller head tone where the vocalis muscle inside the vocal cord would recede much more compared to 
what it would be in the mix. It still influences the voice for a little bit, depending on if you're a mezzo or a soprano. That chest mechanism might still be a little bit active as you go higher, but not to a great extent. If it's too active, it, it really diminishes the, 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 the power of the voice. It has to engage much more head voice in order for the larynx to tilt and go into a lower position. If it stays chesty, the chord does not lengthen and the larynx does not stay low. So That's basically it's the same mechanism as man, but it's just it's that same, just you're higher. dealing with smaller vocal cords. So it's Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's just higher. And, and a lot of times you get full lyric sopranos that sing very chesty from C5 to F5, and they are always typecast as soubrettes. They get Despina, they get all these light roles because they're like, right? It is like, because they, they sound too light because they're singing chesty all the way to F, as if they're bringing the chest mix from, from F4 to C5, they're bringing it now from C5 to F5, and they're still singing, yeah, they're singing like a, right. almost like a like pop a singer. Threat. Right. And so they get, they get all these roles where if they just initiate a little bit more deeper breath and went to a yawn, then they would have a different kind of phonation in that mid-range. And now all of a sudden they would be a full lyric soprano. So more uh, uh, towards the ooh, like kind of vowel. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, it, it's more like an ooh position for the larynx, it's, it's a harmonic. That fundamental harmonic, that's the fundamental, that, that fluty quality, that's yeah. the typical harmonic that's present in the head voice. It's the weakest harmonic for a tenor and it's the strongest harmonic for a soprano. Yeah, so you, you have to just know where the voices have to mix, where they need to start one, me one mechanism compared to the other and help them fine tune that registration, that shift in registers, yeah, and know how to navigate that. Of course, there's always a, a, an element of chord closure and epiglottic lowering that gives the higher harmonics. So even when you're singing in head voice, you might have this incredibly strong resonance, but it's not chest. You know, some people think, oh yeah, well that's soprano, listen to that bidu sayao. That A flat was so ringy, you can hear all that chest voice. What? No, <laughs> no, that's not chest voice. That's higher harmonics due to the epiglottic lowering and to the incredible efficiency in the chord closure. It has nothing to do with the epiglottic, like the 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 la boue, uh, the... the the little flap behind the tongue, right? Yeah, when yeah, you yeah follow, I like... It lowers and it protects the windpipe, right? When you sing, if you lower it it creates a tuning of the higher harmonics. It narrows the larynx. It narrows the exit of the larynx. We call laringe piccola, the mm -hmm. smaller larynx. It's, it's this narrowing of the exit of the but larynx. But that is, that is uh, further from the, I mean, it's not really it's the larynx. It's above the vocal cords. It's you above know? the larynx. It, well, yeah, it's at the top. If you think of the larynx as a tube, yeah. You know, the, the epiglottis is just right above the tube and it kind of covers it. So if the, if the epiglottis lowers, the exit space of the larynx is reduced and it tunes higher harmonics, right? It has nothing. But can you really control that? I mean, yes, you can. Absolutely. If you think, for example, of going, all you're doing there is lowering the epiglottis to go from one to the other. So that kind of, yeah. that's, that's epiglottic lowering. If the so you do it by sound, following the sound, basically. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, the right now I saw your sound. teeth, but uh, you could because do it I, wrong too. I know what to do to give me certain harmonics, right? Right. But initially, you know, someone will not know how to do that. They'll, you have to coax them into making certain sounds and to discover sound possibilities and, and to understand and discover what the mechanisms are that are causing them to get that sound, right? So, yeah, that's the, that's the process of discovery where mm -hmm. you learn what your voice is capable of doing, you know? Yeah. That's in the studio. You learn how to do those things. There are certain exercises that help you get there. So, so Jack, so, so we don't have the, I don't, I don't want to leave the baritones out. So, uh, so you describe some of the elements for tenor, some of the elements for soprano. Now, uh, if you, if we go, uh, to the baritones, it's this, uh, 
what is what is the particular element in their in their um, education that is important? Yep, it's it's the same technique as a tenor um, or a soprano, meaning that they have certain inflection points within the range where they have to start tilting the larynx to lengthen the chord. It's just lower. Um, so for a baritone, for example, they have to start tilting around A flat. Oh, if they're like, ah, oh, not that low. Oh, <laughs> at the, around A flat, they have to go more toward that cavita, toward that yawn position to get the vocal cords to start lengthening. Yeah, that sense of cavita. The difference, the main difference for a baritone and a tenor is that the baritone focuses on the width. They want the beefier sound. They are the baritone. A, yes. Yeah. They want to, their top note is G or A flat. You can get baritones that can sing even a high C. Yeah. But they don't, uh, they, they, they're not going to go there as normal singing. That's not what they do. They aim for a width in the middle. So their big notes are like D. D is like a big <laughs> note. Or you listen to that. You know, uh, what's his name? Uh, American. Tonight, names are just totally out. Ah, uh, yes. Sir. American baritone. Uh, uh, Warren. Wa no, not no, Warren. No, Warren. The one that sang with, with Tucker. Um, uh, ah, yes. Uh, uh, sang in the, the National Inn. The, uh, the, the National. He was a yeah, Yankees yeah, fan. National Inn of the Yankees. Right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. right. Robert Merrill. Merrill. Yeah. Robert Merrill, right? He's <laughs> yeah. famous for that high E. Final <laughs> Right, that famous E natural on, on uh, in the Force of the Destino. Oh yeah, that right? the, he shakes that's the Opera House, shaking. Note in his voice, right, Robert Merrill. That's a huge note, um, and and that's the kind of note that you that you want to have loudest as a baritone. You know, yes, you turn an F sharp and maybe even a G, a powerful, and they're powerful big notes, but they're also aiming for squillo the same way that a tenor often does. And it's just more beef. You know, you think of Del Monaco on steroids. That's what <laughs> that's what a baritone should be, like Del Monaco on steroids, you know, if that's even possible. Uh, you know, that's that's the way that a, a baritone should should think. You know, yes, they have slimness. They they're not forcing the voice. It's naturally big. It's always got to be unforced. You know, if you're pressing, you're pushing the air out of your body. It's never going to work. You know, you have to find volume based on the efficiency of the harmonics, not on a push, right? So even for a baritone, it's always balanced. It's never pushed air. It's always sul fiato, right? It's always on the balance of the compression. But their idea of sound is much wider than a tenor in the middle, right? A tenor's looking for a baby sound. Yeah, that very gentle light sound so that they can go up and ah! and open up that sound, right? A baritone's like, ah! much more width in the sound, mm. right? In the middle to give that impression because their climax on in the notes is in the middle. Yes, right? it's true. The basis climax for the notes is down. They want to give a huge impression on their low notes. N nobody cares if a, a bass can sing a high B flat. <laughs> that would be crazy, right? <laughs> if they can sing a nice F, that's great. If it's present, you know, that's a wonderful thing. But we want to hear Sparta Fuchi to Sparta Fuchi. We want to hear those low notes just rumble in yeah. the house, right? A baritone, we want to hear the voice strong in the middle. A tenor, we want to hear the voice strong in the top. You know? So yeah. every voice is 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 their own fuck, it's their own mm. different uh quality and, and place where they sfogion, where they, they where they emerge hmm. with power. If you try to emerge in the wrong place, you're going to mess yourself up. Yeah. This is why verismo is very difficult for a tenor because it wants you to emerge in a baritone range and you're not supposed to. You're supposed to sing gently there so that you can go up. You can easily get stuck in that repertoire because now you can't do anything else and your top is now compromised. You only sing forte and up until be natural, maybe. Hmm. Yes, no, exactly. Lucky. Uh, uh, one question, Jack. I have something uh, I, I've um, experienced uh, by listening uh, a lot. Is um, it seems to me like 
the heavier the voice, if they sing right, the more falsetto-like sounds their high notes. Yes. I don't know if you agree with this. Yes, like, of course. I've heard the other day some Wagnerian tenor, and he, and uh, he he sang. Uh, he sings. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I said, was it Vin Gassen? Yeah, Something Vin Gassen. Like with yeah. a very uh, you know deep voice. Yes. And uh, he was singing. Uh, I think Nessun Dorma in in in, in German, <laughs> and the high note was really like <laughs> like a connected a, a Yes, absolutely, but very loud. Uh, they are, they're still loud. Okay. loud singers. Yeah, these were loud singers. They have, uh, you have to distinguish between the lightness and the volume. The recordings don't always give justice to the volume. You know, today, for example, Joseph Kalea is one of those singers who sounds in the top like it, it might be very light. Does it have any volume? And then you go listen and he's towering over everybody. It's just crazy how loud. I mean, besides the fact that his chest is like twice mine. <laughs> yeah, he's, <laughs> he's a big guy. Yeah. He's a big guy, right? Yeah. So his vocal cords are, are probably commensurate to that yeah. body. But it, the the quality of the timbre would be misleading. Like you would think that it's not loud, right? Skipa, one of the light tenors of the past, right? Tito Skipa. Yes, Tito. He, right. My dad would tell me I could hear him outside the arena in Verona singing Don Pasquale, the only singer that I could ever hear outside. His voice would tower out of the out of the whole arena in Verona, right? How is that even possible for such a light singer? The timbre does not always convey the correct impression of volume, right? So, you know, and it's the same for Fach. The Fach is determined not so much by the color You might have a very, very powerful soprano or tenor or baritone voice that's huge, but it sounds kind of light. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah. I remember one of your students uh, like this, uh, uh, Nicholas. Nicholas Simpson. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, his, his timbre is, is, uh, is somewhat uh, light uh, on the light. top, and it's just like... <laughs> But very big sound. Like a projectile, yeah. yes, yes. But look at him. I mean, he's huge. <laughs> Another one that has a chest this big, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, and that's what I'm saying. And and notwithstanding the color might be light, that is the right voice to do a spinto opera. Because that voice can carry over any orchestration. Mm. You know? Marco Berti is another example. Uh, an another Wagnerian tenor that's very a la moda right now, Klaus Florian Vogt. I don't know if you know this this Wagnerian tenor. No, no, but I, 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 I was on stage with him when he made his debut at the Met uh, doing uh, Parsifal. And literally, it was like, Infernem land, una paro. It's, to my ear, it sounded so white. It was the loudest thing I've ever heard live. It was huge. And I understand why he does all the Wagnerian repertoire in Bayreuth and everywhere. You know, and, and he's very much liked because he can carry over anything, but he's also able to do a lot of the nuanced things that a lot of Wagnerians don't do, right? He might not be everybody's mm. cup of tea. I mean, if I listen to him, I, I, I want to hear Vingassen. I want to hear other, <laughs> other Wagnerians, right? Because of the color. The color, like, yeah. You can't deny the artistic ability and the palette, the availability of colors. So that's to say, it is very important for any aspiring singer to maximize their ability to sing a variety of dynamics of colors and so forth and to make that part of their technical quest yeah if you get stuck in one mode of phonation forte all the time you're going to be limited nobody wants a monochromatic singer today today conductors command everything and if they ask you to do piano and you can't do it they'll go to somebody else Right? You have to be able to uh, sing a variety of dynamics and colors. And that's why you know, people say, oh, but Del Monaco was the greatest singer ever because he was so loud. But today, Del Monaco would have a hard time unless he did just Otello. And yeah. then again, he and might have somebody that might say, okay, sing piano on Venere Splende, the, the end of the duet. They might want a piano, right? He would not be able to do that piano. 
And to, and two, uh, one has to think that Del Monaco this didn't necessarily didn't uh, he he wanted to sing piano, that was a quest of his. Yeah. Uh, at one point, and uh, he just couldn't at one point, but 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 he he, he was his initially, intention to do it. Yes, and initially he could even when he was doing this big stuff. It's just Otello really skewed, and 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 we're back to the same thing when you choose operas that skew your voice towards certain volumes because of the orchestration that you're up against, it, it's inevitable that it, it dwarfs, it, 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 uh, it modifies the, the, um, the trajectory of your technique over the decades, right? So Del Monaco started being able to sing very beautifully many things. I mean, there are recordings of Bali Masca, the butterfly, where he does some incredible things, really beautiful things. And he himself says, you know, when he started doing Otello, that all went out the window because now you're like, si per cel, pop, 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 You have this huge brass. How are you going to compete with that? There's no way. They'll smother you like many. I shouldn't say many, like a few famous tenors today that sing Otello. And you're like, I can't hear you. In that area, especially in the, of the opera, where the, you're up against that thick orchestration, it's like they're gone because they're singing. Forget that. That's not air doesn't travel. Only sound travels. So when you put a lot of air in your sound, you go. Ah! That's not going to travel. It might sound dramatic because it's dark. But yeah, they call it. Yeah. When dark is air, it's useless. Because air does not travel, only sound travels. Mm. So when a voice is dark because of air, you're actually damaging the technique. The voice should be dark because the harmonics, the lower harmonics, are efficient. But when they are efficient, the higher ones are usually also very efficient. So when you have a correctly dark voice, it's also very bright at the same time, right? When yeah. the voice is dark because of air, it's small in the house. You're pushing like crazy trying to control this voice um, because now the vocal cords are struggling because they don't know what to do with that air. And, and, and it's, it's all getting stuck because all this air is causing fatigue to the vocal cord, right? And it's getting fatter and fatter and fatter. And you're trying to squeeze now to control this air where you should have in the beginning thought to not do that at all, to stay very much sul fiato and allow the 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 you know the the flow of air to be dictated by the necessity of the sound rather than you trying to push the air out just just for the sake of pushing air out you know can one has uh, have a, a sound that is really bright but still push air on it yes of course okay okay because you can have you can have a a pretty good compression in the cord even when the back of the cord is a little bit loose right you can you can squeeze in the in middle the rest yeah. when the back is is pretty is a little bit loose so what's called in science a mutational chink it's a little opening in the back of the cord right and it stays a little bit open and air can leak through but you're able to squeeze the middle to produce enough energy that coupled with the epiglottic lowering can tune the higher harmonics. But you still hear air in the sound. That's ah! still air. Ah! But it's, uh. it can still be bright. And you hear this a lot in Mozart tenors. Uh. Right, it's, it's kind of has a little bit of an airy quality. Yeah. And the unfortunate thing is that it always ends up being pushed, and it tops out easily at a natural. Hmm. And the higher you go, the more the air wants to leak out and push. Yeah. And and the, the the tragic thing is that you're always told if you get enough focus, you'll be able to to overcome this problem. So what they do is they squeeze what's already being squeezed <laughs> to try to squeeze it harder. Right? Where in reality, they shouldn't be squeezing at all. They should just be finding the real, clear, efficient vowel. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, and then trying to work that clarity through the voice very gently and lightly, trying to minimize that excursion of air and just make it very, very 
calm, almost like the air is evaporating out, like steam, rather than you pushing the air out. Yeah. But that's example actually is a little bit confusing to me because I can hear the the intention you have is still the gentleness that you're talking about. Yeah. So so, uh, so I guess you know that there can be a, a mind uh, confusion yes. there because where you gentleness is not enough. Mm. Gentleness is not enough. You have the the number one thing for an opera singer is the chord closure. That is the most absolute thing. That's the appoggio. When your appoggio is intact, when the chord is closing along the whole length, then you're able to harness the breath. If your chord does not close on the whole length, you have a very, very big problem. There is nothing you can do technically to fix that. And quite frankly, nothing works right when you don't have that. You can have all these other things working exactly right, but when that's missing, everything else goes out the window. You have to have a very clean closure along the entire edge of the chord. When there's a little bit of an opening in the back, some people have that genetically. Like mm. they cannot close the back, you know, right where the little knobs, the, the, the um, um, man, words tonight are escaping me. The, the, uh, the, uh, the right at the back the of the chord. Thank you. The arytenoids. Yeah. Yeah. When the arytenoids swing to the middle and they close the the vocal process when the, when the chords come together at the midline that arytenoid area has to seal if it doesn't and there's a little bit of an opening and the air can leak through this is very damaging for an opera singer there are some people that learn how to make it through that but it's it's not ideal and there's oh, no this. support that can help you fix that if it doesn't close because it's not about support it's actually a set of muscles The, in the interarytenoids, right in the back, the laterals, the ones that like close the, the, yeah. the arytenoid area. If they are not active enough to close that uh, that area, you have a very big problem. As well, it's opera. actually like support doesn't work because support is depending on you're leaning on on something. You lean on the you, uh, yeah, that's, on that's the closure. Great. So that's if you cannot accurate. lean on the closure, how can you support? You know? Yeah, yeah. And that's very accurate. I mean, you, your your support is measuring the breadth stream. Right. But if the breath stream is leaking, you have a problem. Right. It, you're always running out of breath faster than what you should. You you'll have a certain airy quality. Sometimes the volume decreases because of that. And, and you end up squeezing the rest of the cord a little bit harder to try to compensate for the airiness because you hear it. And now you're trying to make it more efficient. And so you end up squeezing the rest of the cord that's closing rather than closing the part that can't close. See what I'm saying? So it's, yeah. a, it's a very problematic thing mm. that occurs. Everybody should get scoped at the beginning of their studies, you know, and find out if they have the ability to actually close that part of the cords. If you go to a very, very good ENT that knows singing and that can analyze that part of your larynx to see that you can close the chords before making you know a huge investment in opera not everybody can be an nba player no. <laughs> you're not, like, seven feet tall. You, know, you know what i'm saying not everybody can be an opera singer there might be physical realities that work against you that you might spend an inordinate amount of money and sacrifice and time and an uphill battle now having said that there are singers that have these problems. There are singers <laughs> that have huge problems on their vocal cords, bumps on the on the edges and and you know the, their closure is compromised and still they're able to make it. Is there anybody maybe in the past you know that maybe it's not alive anymore that you could like give an example of this? I uh, not that no, I'm no. A, I'm totally aware no. but I I've heard stories no. about people that have had vocal surgery. I think even Pavarotti May yeah, Pavarotti suffers on uh, nodules thing. You're right, right, right. Yeah. You know, when you have when you have a bump on the edge of the cord, when the cords approximate, that bump creates a, an impediment for the closure. So it might leave a gap along the edge of the cord where the air does not totally get harnessed, right? So that's why often a, a surgeon will want to remove that outer layer of the epithelium, that outside layer of the cord, Um, just at that edge to kind of clear out that bump 
so that the cords can close along the whole length. Because what ends up happening then is that bump bumps against the other side, and that can create like a nodule on the other side. And now you have two bumps on each side, and when they come together, yeah. they leave a huge gap in the rest of the cord because now there are two bumps. When they're soft, often the cord is able to close notwithstanding, but if they get hard, like, I don't know, you know, sometimes uh, lesions and stuff, they can become scar tissue and, and they become hard. Then it's a very big problem yeah. for a singer. But I'm telling you, th I've heard stories of <laughs> singers that their cords are really messed up. But it just depends because there's also stories of, there's a very famous tenor that I won't name his name, but he was at the very top. You know, and, and he sounded just like Domingo. And he was singing everywhere and very famous. And then he started doing stuff that was not right because his agents were pushing him in a direction of repertoire that was wrong. And his voice was not loud enough. He hemorrhaged the chord. It created an anomaly on the edge. And now his voice does not work, even though the technique was still the same. But the edge does not close the way he's expecting. I don't know if he's had surgery. I know like people like Kaufman has, has said that he's had you know, these, these problems that, 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 um, French coloratura soprano, I don't remember her name. Ah, she, yes. Uh, that's say, they say, they say, yeah. She's, she's been very open about having had various surgeries. I mean, yes, she said that, that yeah. It's like crazy, but you know, these, 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 there are people out there that Incredible. have crazy things going on with their larynx, but they're able to make it. And it's because the, the edge of the cord is not compromised to the point where that it can't completely closed if you can't close the edge you have a problem because yeah. then the air leaks and you always try to do stuff to squeeze to overcome that obstacle because you can hear it in the sound that the air dirties the sound right and you feel it technically because you're not really on the breath you feel leakage and so you you're always kind of uh, giving a little bit more squeeze to try to make it to a clear efficient sound right and the mm -hmm. more you do that that worse it gets over time Right. So, you know, it, it's, it's a problem because we, we are in a marathon. The opera singer has to think 20, 30 years, not two, three. <laughs> These problems can become very, very serious over four or five years. And so, you know, when you have to think what is going to allow me to stay in this business for like 20 years, not four or five, because that's the time you need to start getting going, you know, <laughs> in, in the major houses. Yeah. All right, Jack. Look, uh, I wanted to again check is, is here the the chat because I think it got really busy while we were talking. Let's see if uh, somebody gets uh, some some last questions. Uh, yep. I think uh, before it gets and too then you late. Don't sleep. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, Jack Bouchard is around. Hey, Jack. Hi. Uh, well, uh, thanks uh, for watching. Uh, Raphael. Raphael is watching from Australia. Hey, Raph. <laughs> Love you. So Raphael is there. Susan Jean so uh Mabel Mer is there. Uh okay, so Thanks everybody for tuning in. Appreciate it. Um uh, Philippe Lacai, uh Barrett John Barriton here, very promising. Um Barriton. Um Will be the oh yeah, will there be a recording of this Zoom conversation anywhere? Yes, uh, yes, uh Philippe, it's it will be here in Facebook, so so you know um yeah just uh, just check it out in the la Sena website or don adriano is there it will uh, it will also be on, on on youtube so you know if if you couldn't if you got late i think he's he got late because uh other stuff uh, so uh, so yes you can watch it here you can rewatch it later um and then you can rewatch any of the old programs to uh uh <laughs> um Three weeks ago, we had the tenor special with the top ten tenors, and we went four and a half hours discussing this. Ten, this <laughs> How boring! <laughs> <laughs> but no, but you know what? Actually, was uh, really nice that we 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 were putting some uh, excerpts of of each of the tenors. Of so yeah. so um, yeah, it's very. Great. Uh, yes, and and um, okay. So Alan has a question here. Um, are the baritone or basses who get louder on the high notes doing similar things? How do uh, a baritone develops a thicker middle? Yeah, they they have to sing more into it. 
You know, you, you, you don't back off. If, you, if you're singing, like, let's say, between A natural and D in a way that is too light, then you're singing like a tenor, right? And you won't develop the, the engagement of, of the sound. So when the voice turns, first of all, it might not turn like until you get to F if you're singing too light, right? Um, and it, it will not have the right color. You might be a baritone, for example, and if you're singing too light between A and D, everybody will think that you're a tenor because you're singing like a tenor. You're not really engaging the, the, the chest mechanism. The, the, the chord is too thin. And so you're not really engaging the voice properly. This is very difficult because you know you, the teacher has to be really uh, attentive to discern if the voice, what it, what it sounds like when it's tilted. A tenor, when he tilts at A natural or A flat, sounds weak a yes. baritone when they tilt at a flat a sounds much more massive uh, a baritone that tilts on a d sounds like he's roaring a tenor that tilts on a d sounds like he's beginning to get toward the passaggio right <laughs> so the, the 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 teacher has to know these sounds even in a beginner and get them to make let's say a, a yawn position sound Oh, oh, and see what the voice does. Even if it's not completely efficient, you'll get an impression, an oil impression of, of what that sound is like. And you can start to categorize the voice, right? So you'll, you'll tell, okay, is this a, a, a baritone? Is it a dramatic tenor? What's going on? It doesn't matter because at the beginning, they're nothing. They're not baritone, they're not tenor, they're nothing, right? But as they start to build... You, if you if you build it with the idea of strengthening that area, like around C, you start to get a feel for how strong does it get when you tilt lower, or how strong does it get when you go a step higher. The tenor will be a little bit weaker down below, and the baritone will start roaring. You know, they, they, they have a much bigger sound. You've just got to get them to not back off. If they get too... Uh, yeah. You'll never know. They will never know what voice they are because they're not really singing. You know? So I guess a, a baritone shouldn't be too... Um, nobody should be too concerned about range at the beginning now that you say that, I guess. Right? No, of course not. The most important thing at the beginning is to identify the voice in the middle. You build... You build the voice from the middle. This is like the most... Uh, the oldest and most important notion in the Italian school. Si costruisce la voce dai centri. So you, you identify your middle voice and then you, you build in both directions from there. And you learn how to navigate the transition downward and the transition upward based on the correct phonation in the middle. You don't build the voice high and then you learn how to sing in the middle based on the high. That's That's foolish. Because you'll never develop the fullness of your voice, right? You might have a high voice and then nobody can hear you once you get to like an F. What's that going to do for you, yeah. right? It's like your voice empties out. <laughs> right? And I have a lot of tenors that have this problem because they've, they've, they've you know, developed so much the high, the high, the high. How do I sing high? How do I sing high? And they've neglected... How do you then go down and get the chord to thicken so that you can actually have a low voice? You know, I remember Marcello Giordani, bless his, bless his soul. He would sing, Nessun Norma, Nessun. <laughs> right? He didn't have a low voice. It was, it, was, it was an extraordinary voice. He could sing high C's that would blow your, your hair off your head. Like if you had the wet hair, he would dry your hair for you. You didn't need a blow dryer. <laughs> It was amazing, just incredible volume. But the low voice was a little bit neglected. But you know what? He's a tenor. Nobody cares about your low notes. You know, you just have to have somewhat of a low note so that it's not just, ah. And he, he had to struggle and other tenors have struggled and they, they've learned how to get their voice to, you know, the chord to thicken a little bit more as they go down. It's not natural for everyone to do that, Yeah. 
Some voices are just natural. They know how to go to that low range, and other voices become like this. Yeah. Go down. Because the vocalist never really thickens much. It's very interesting. Every voice yeah. is different and presents different problems. You have to address them. But from the beginning, if you focus on the middle and then you extend in both directions, you're more likely to build a more organic and, and um, correct phonation mm. and more natural. And that's what you need because you're singing in the middle, right? If you're like, this is all middle voice. If you if you're like, it's like it's all skewed in the wrong direction, right? Yeah. You learn to sing in the middle, and then you expand in both direction. That creates a more expressive sound because you're focusing on the nature of the sound and the part where you're most communicative because the composers wrote the part in the middle of your voice, right? If they're good, if they're good, <laughs> which are the ones that we sing. So if you're, if you're singing and you're in the middle, you have to be as natural and communicative as you can. So that's where you build the voice first to expand it in all its qualities, right? Yes, if you're a tenor, it'll be lighter than a baritone, but nonetheless, it still has to be open and engaged, even in the lightness. That doesn't mean, light does not mean less. Light is light. It's a quality of timbre. It's a configuration in the vocal cords, but it's not a volume. Light is not a volume. You have to sing theatrically with resonance and power, harnessing the breath in the middle. And then you learn how to go up, maintaining that lightness in the chord, harnessing the power of the breath, mm. right? And you learn how to go down equally. You thicken the chord a little bit more rather than thinning it out. You thicken it a little bit more, but you stay on the same compression, the same appoggio of sound, right? Mm. So th this, these are things that are done over years, years and years and years. Now, some people say, oh, I, I studied for six months. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> no. I had one famous, a very famous tenor came to MOS ones and he, a very, very famous Spinto tenor. And, uh, you know, he said, How long has this person been studying? He said, I, I think he's been studying now for like two years. He's like, Two years. I sang after six months of studying. And I looked at him, I'm like, Okay good for you you are <laughs> truly the ex i didn't say this to him but i was like you are truly the exception to this rule if you sang after i don't believe him first of all because i don't think that it's true <laughs> he, sang, he studied with marcello del monaco for six months but he had other teachers before yeah which he did not say you know yeah you studied with your famous teacher for six months and he created your voice but you had been studying for many years with other people they impacted your voice too even though you don't recognize it, yeah? There's always something that comes positive from other teachers, even when you change teacher and you go to another. Totally. You, you, you're always building on something. You don't just say, oh, that teacher stinked. I'm, I'm the great teacher, I built their voice. No, I have singers that come to me that some are not that great, some are actually quite fabulous. Am I gonna say, oh, I built their voice, I'm, I'm their teacher, they're famous because of, no. That's absurd. We all, we're in this as a cooperative type of activity, right? Where we, as teachers, are trying to maximize the ability of that singer. Some people, it's easier to work with because you tell them to do this and they do it. And other people, you have to coax them into doing it over a long period of time. It's always surprising. The really, really good singers, they, they'll maybe come to me and I'll say, well, look, you're not really tilting here. I need you to do this. And they just do it. Like, why did you do that? I don't know. Nobody told me. But they can do it. That just shows that the, the, the awareness that they have of their instrument is already incredibly refined because of all the studies that they've done before. Yeah. Right? They didn't do that with me. They did that with somebody else. So this is an important, you know, teachers are not like that. Unfortunately, a lot of teachers, I'd say, not, not everybody. A lot of teachers are not like that. You know, they get, you know, I'm at Curtis. I'm going to get the best singers coming to my studio. 
or I'm at AVA. I'm only going to let the best singers into my studio. And they walk in and they like already won the Met competition. And now they're studying with you. And all of a sudden I put them out there. I'm the best teacher in the universe. You, see how <laughs> people are you know, that happens. And it's unfortunate I, yeah. because what it creates is the mentality that one teacher has to be completely discarded because they are not the last one. But that's not fair. There are many singers out there that, you know, are great singers now, but they started with somebody that may not have completed their journey, but they were incredibly important because without them, they would have not been ready for the next step. Do we just say, oh, no, uh, they were bad. That, that's kind of ridiculous to, to say that, right? Yeah, they might not have gotten you the whole way, but you have to recognize the, the basis and the foundation that was there. And sometimes there's some negative things. It's true. You might have a bad teacher and a lot of singers, but don't get influenced by the, by the negativity that's out there. There's always something positive that trails you, that comes with you when you make um, you know, a switch and you have to hang on to the things that are positive. And the teacher has to also be recognizing and positive about those things to recognize them and say, you have to hold on to this. You do this very well. We have to build on that, not abandon it because it came from somebody else. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. This is important because it, it's a kind of mentality that if it's not there, it really creates a negative environment in a studio and also in the mind of the singer, a competitive and almost catty and negative. Uh, oh, my teacher's better than yours. Ah, no, you know, this. sometimes that happens in singer circles because we're so defensive. If something is not right, oh, don't talk about me. You know, there's that kind of fear. <laughs> it's what, what it is, is it's fear, fear of failing because it, this is always so far outside of our control that it's it's always so very much embedded with fear, right? And 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 the odds are so astronomically against us all the time that it's it it's it becomes very competitive and you kind of protect your environment you protect the studio you come from nobody can talk bad about your studio because now all of a sudden it impacts me as a singer because i come from that studio do you see what i'm saying these are all wrong things a singer is a great singer because they are expressive because they are able to convey the emotion and their vocal abilities don't get in the way of that expressivity their might, technique might not be the best in the universe, but if their failings don't get in the way of their expressivity, they are far better than the technical proficient people that can't sing, that don't have anything to say. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard it many times, like in competitions, somebody will get up and they'll sing, and they sing all these high Cs. <laughs> and then the guy gets up and goes, it's very expressive or it'll sing like uh i don't know some aria that does not go high like kuda kuda right and he brings all that russian melancholy that that tchaikovsky embedded into that music and expresses it in such an incredible way heartfelt and and riveting that person will win the competition even though they sang an a flat and then the singer's like, I sang a high C, I did a triple toe loop, Lutz, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and he only landed a single. You know, that's the mentality. But this is the problem with competitions now, too. Yes, that, but it's not you just know, competitions. You call it a competition. Of course, there's already calling a competition makes me think, okay, this is like a basketball game or the Olympics of the voice, you know? Yeah, yeah. Whoever but, sings but louder I'm, and higher. Voice, you no, know, it's not that. There are many singers that win competitions that are not the highest singing ones, that are not the loudest ones, but they are the most organically put together. They can sing legato. They're expressive. They're, the energy in their vowel is flowing from note to note. Their, their vibrato goes from one syllable to the next because it's all linked harmonically. Not singing legato just putting one vowel together with another, but they're blending resonances and blending harmonics and, and, and vibrato rates from note to note. All these little things that people don't think about that make the difference between an amateur and a professional. You know, These are important things that win competitions. You don't have to be the biggest voice or the highest voice to win a competition. You just have to be very good 
at expressing and being artistic with your choices. And then you'll see that the people that know hear you and they reward you for that. Nobody cares about your nine high C's. Nobody. <laughs> There's always another tenor that has more high C's than you do. Yeah, that's true. Not about that. <laughs> hmm. Um, um, uh, Jack, I have. I promised people that I would um, at least try to answer the question. I have another one here. Can can, can we do it? Yes. Ah, last okay. one, and then I'm okay, gonna. Last, and then I, I and I have one for for okay. myself. Right. I have okay. to profit. <laughs> okay. Um, well, he congratulates. This is Niels Brown. I don't know if you've heard Niels, Niels Brown. Uh, uh, fantastic tenor. Like, uh, anyways. Um, he he's asking is, is he's congratulating you for all the this info Thank and you. the conversation, and he says, is there a difference in appoggiare between traditional voice production and melocchi appoggiare? It seems that the traditional is lower, as the terms has been referred to, and in contrast, uh, Franco Corelli says, in great singers of singing, you must appoggiare lean on the vocal cords themselves. Maybe this is a tilt uh, which has been referenced uh, through this conversation. Yeah, that's a great question. Appoggiare in the tradition has nothing to do with the way you breathe. That's supporto della voce, to support the voice, to, il sostegno di fiato, the sustaining of the, of the breath, the way that you breathe in and you engage the, the intercostal area and the abdominal area, the... the epigastrium, the hypogastrium, which one goes in, which one goes out, all these kinds of factors are about regulating the stream of air. That's not appoggio. T nowadays, people talk about appoggio and they, they translate it as support. That's not what support was in the, in the old school. Appoggiare was the leaning of the voice onto the pressurized column of breath. So the way that your sound interacts with the column of breath and the air movement was uh, the, the the locus of that was at the larynx. Corelli is correct. That's that's the tradition. The Italian tradition is a laryngeal tradition, meaning that the source of all vibrations is at the larynx. Lauri Volpi talks about this. Fondere il tubo pneumatico con il tubo sonoro. Fusing the, the pneumatic tube, the air tube, with the sound tube. They meet at the larynx, at the cords, and at that juncture, the raggi sonori, the sound rays, are created, and then those sound rays go and strike in strategic points in the mask. It's, it's, it's a way of thinking of voice that's very, actually very effective, even though it's objectively not correct, but it describes sensations that correlate to very specific things that we do physically. So the appoggio in the tradition is the ability to lean the sound onto the breath that's underneath the chords. So G, we talk about cantare sull'aria sotto le corde vocali, singing on the, the air that's accumulated under the vocal cords. We don't feel a, 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 st a stricture. We don't feel like a, a muscular closing that blocks the air, yeah. like a grunt. Yeah. If we do, usually that's because we have recruited the false chords, like when we lift a weight, <sighs> right? And so that that will close the chords, but it'll close much more than just the chords, right? And it's going to, to really jeopardize the flexibility in the lar in the vocal cords to vibrate freely. <clears throat> Even doing that <laughs> gave me... <laughs> me too, it gave me some mucus. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, the, the idea of appoggiare was to find the efficiency in the chord closure that allows for the maximizing of the sound rays or the resonance. So in the old school, you learned how to sustain the glottal action. So if you think saying the vowel, a, a, e, i, there's a very specific closure that happens in the moment of uttering the vowel. E, come va? This kind of action in the Italian language is very evident. It's all full of what I've called baby glottals. Now this is a very common term. <clears throat> I invented that term. <laughs> baby glottals. This idea of, of uh, doing a glottal as though you're speaking. Ah, come va? 
Bene, grazie. Ah, 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 ah. These are all very small glottal actions that get the cords to the midline to resist the airflow. And so when we get to that kind of, uh, you know, uh, efficiency in the sound, the airstream that moves through the cords has to be very measured because if it's not, you will break the resonance. Yeah, there's a very specific resonance that happens when the cords are efficiently closed, when the larynx is down, when the tongue is forward, increasing the space in the laryngeal pharynx. Yeah, there's all this confluence of factors along with the epiglottis lowering. This all creates a confluence of factors that maximizes the resonance in your sound. And that efficiency in the vocal cords is a very specific interaction with the breath. If the breath moves too fast, it breaks the resonance. If it's too slow and you're starving the voice of air, the vocal cords will stick too hard together and it will kill your resonance as well. So you have to find the exact flow that allows the voice to continue to merge very, very rich. And usually the way that the singer feels that is an evaporation of air. <clears throat> I like to think of it like if you are, um, like if you get a mirror or a glass and you blow on it, if you move the air too fast, it won't fog. But if you, if you move the energy of the breath very slowly, there, there, it will steam up the whole glass. I like to think of it like that. So while you're singing, fog the glass, don't rush the air but let it evaporate and find the exact closure in the cord. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, and then sustain that glottal action. Ah, uh, to maximize the efficiency. And you find the appoggio, meaning you find how much air can actually be moved through the cord and maintain the sound. So the sound triggers the support. You're in the right compression already from the beginning, but then the sound ultimately determines how much air the body will actually expel. Because if, it, if the sound becomes airy, the body is ejecting air. No matter what you do to support, it's going to still move air. Because ultimately, the diaphragm is not under our conscious control. It's, we think it is, and we try to maintain, but it's really not. It's really determined by the sound. So when we're in the right suspension, and we're finding this exact appoggio of the sound onto the column of the breath. The sound becomes very efficient. If we move too much air, it breaks the resonance. If we move too little air, it breaks the resonance. So we find the right balance and we try to maintain that up and down the scale, making the necessary adjustments to maintain that exact efficiency. That's the whole premise of, of singing and registration. You make the adjustments so that you can maintain the correct chord closure and appoggio. You don't just make, you don't turn the voice for the sake of turning the voice. You turn the voice so that you can maintain that exact efficiency throughout the whole scale. So it's always the resonance of the sound that's determining what you should be doing technically. Without the chord closure, nothing works. Like I said before, right? All the technical things that we do, tilting, lift the soft palate, move the tongue up, or relax the jaw, nothing works unless your cords are closing efficiently and producing resonance efficiently. Everything goes out the window. It's the number one technical thing that should be worked on from the beginning and throughout the entire career. It's the thing that can decay the fastest when we get old and we, the cords might start getting a little bit, you know, we might start singing dark or whatever and moving more air or pushing and the cord closure goes out the window. It's the number one thing that we should be working on throughout our whole career to ensure that the, that the voice is working and is fine-tuned. Jerome Hines talks about this in the book, Great Singers and Great Singing, how working with, with um, Tucker got him into a much more closed chord position, and, now, and he found a new life to his voice because of that chord closure. He says, I sounded like a baritone, but it, man, did it, it picked up my voice. And then I started singing again the way I normally would as bass, and everything was working well because he had fine-tuned again the musculature for that chord closure in his later years and found the correct balance. So Nils, that's a, a great question, you know, about appoggio. And I think it's a, a very important technical concept that has been lost. You know, we, we nowadays we just say appoggio, oh, that's, that means support. What am I doing with my support? And there are a lot of specialists on how to support and how to use the diaphragm. But that's, that's a very, that's a really, really uh, wrong way of thinking of support for me. 
Support means nothing unless you have efficiency of sound. You can support all you want. If your sound is inefficient, the air will move because the sound's inefficient. So it needs more air. So if your mind is hearing an, an, an inefficient airy sound, it will move air because that's the sound that you're hearing in your head. And so it will move air no matter how hard you try to support, it won't happen because the diaphragm is not under your conscious control. It's going to move air to give you the sound that you want to get. So if you're hearing a very efficient and specific, harmonically very exact type of sound that is incredibly crisp and efficient, as I said, then that sound will be stuck in your head and it will determine how you move the air. Yeah, and so that is the foundation of appoggio. You learn how to support based on the needs of the voice. There are definitely things that you do physically, you know, to, to, to power up the breath and all that stuff, no doubt. But that's part of a global system that, you know, a more organic way of looking at the connection between vocal apparatus and diaphragm. And together, that's how you create the correct appoggio, the correct support. Yeah. What was your question, Adrian? Okay, Thanks. so... Great question. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I guess just to let you know, I've I've been I've been working uh, more and more with the U vowel, yeah, but for quite some time actually, because I found that to have like an U envelope under the voice, whatever vowel it is, it kind of I don't know it helped the it helped uh, to transition to head voice, yeah, and to get this sense of of, of morbidezza that you yes. say that uh, of gentleness. Uh, the the thing is that I, uh, when as I'm going up, uh, and after a, a, a high a, <laughs> a natural, <laughs> a natural yeah. I cannot keep for for for, for God's sakes, I cannot keep that that sense of morbidezza uh -huh. that has the ooh, and it feels like I gotta go like eh, like this uh -huh. to actually make the note, but I feel it's a little bit constrained. So yeah, yeah. I guess it's what I, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> yeah. So uh, the U vowel in the tradition works really well to uh, create the conditions of we say a voce raccolta, gathered voice, in the middle and in the passaggio as well. As you get higher in the tenor voice. There, there have been tenors that have brought the U vowel very high in the sound. Like, for example, Bergonzi. Right? Yes, he would sing <laughs> I love what he does. The top. Um, but again, he could sing high C, but the U position is not ideal for high C. It works well up until like A natural or even B flat. But even there, it begins to decay in its efficiency. The real vowel that is incredibly efficient for the high tenor voice is a, the Italian a, which is a mix of a and e. Ah, 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 ah. Not ooh, ah. It, it puts a tongue in a different position. The thing is this, the larynx Comes is up. still in, no, well, the larynx should still be in u position. It's just the tongue and this that should be more in an a ah position. But the larynx should still be in u position. So if you think, you, you're still in the same u. It's just a different kind of tuning that occurs for the harmonics where you're opening Something inside the zygomatic area connects with the soft palate and also the tongue's higher position. It really opens up the harmonics in a different way for the tenor high voice. Yeah. The vowel formant, the way that the vowel resonates with your sound is more effective when you're closer to a ah in these higher notes. It's and it's an a ah, e eh type ha hybrid. This is yeah. from uh, around B flat or even A. Yeah, or... yeah, exactly. You you see like a, the great master class that Alfredo Kraus gives where he's trying to teach the kid that's doing uh, chess. You ever seen that? The poor kid. <laughs> you know, Kraus, uh, Kraus, bless his soul. 
he was a horrible teacher. Uh, he I was, was nasty. Oh, like, <laughs> I, I, you know, in Rome, I remember him telling this kid who was just so high larynx and his voice was all like tight and stuff. And he said, no, la voce non è abbastanza avanti. Like the voice was not far forward enough. And this poor kid was like trying to put his voice even more forward and the larynx was getting higher. It was, it, it's one of those things where singers don't always know how to convey the information um, they're, they're looking at the effect, but not looking at the cause. You have to know the cause, not the effect. You have to know the process, not the result. As a singer, you have to focus always on the process, on the causes, not at the results. Yeah. So the, the U position is not a vowel. It's a positioning of the larynx in that yawn. Ooh. It's cool, man. Like that. It tunes the harmonics in a different way. It keeps the chords long, right? So what I think for you, you need to figure out how to keep your larynx in that U position. Think gentle, but open up to that ah. So differentiate what happens here from what happens um, here. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, but right now, like, it's really, I can do this ah thing, but then... It goes, goes it up. pinches, it pinches here. Right. And the morbidezza is gone, you know? Yeah, but that's because you're associating what happens up here, tongue and jaw, with the larynx. You have to figure out how to make them separate. So one thing I like doing with people, for example, if you lower the larynx, for example, right? So you check your larynx and you think, okay, I'm going to sing low. And then just on like a middle voice note, go, ah, <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Where you move your tongue up and down very yeah. quickly and monitor your larynx to make sure that it's not moving. Uh, uh, yeah, I know it moves. Yeah. 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 If it moves, yeah. then there's too much of a connection between tongue and larynx, right? You have to learn how to disconnect their actions so that they're not influencing each other too much. Otherwise, every time you change vowel, you know, to a brighter a eh or a, ah, you'll pull your larynx up with it. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to learn how to distinct, how to separate them so that you get this going on. The larynx down and the tongue higher. So you can tune the harmonics differently for the high voice, a different vowel. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Great. Technical okay. So it's, uh, I was right. What I thought is, yes, I, I think it's this. I think is the O is not right there. But then I didn't know why, you know, because I think, yeah. ah, but the other way I'm just doing, eh. Yeah. I mean, if <laughs> so, you sing oo going up, that's a specific tongue shape and a specific mouth shape, right? That, right, yeah. Right? It's not just a laryngeal shape. It's actually because the tongue is created largely by the, I mean, the, the vowel is created largely by the tongue. Yes. The tongue shape, right, inside the resonance tract. So if you, if you sing oo, it's kind of limiting if you go high. It's, it, it tunes the harmonics in a very, very narrow way. You listen to Lauri Volpi, you listen to all these people, they sang much more open. Than that. Vowel, yeah. open vowel. Not mm. open in the sense of <sighs> fly out, like in opening up the register, yeah, 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 yeah. the chest voice. They sang in the head voice. That's a much more open position. Yeah, like the 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 pharynx, yeah, well, right. the pharynx in the in the throat yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. The, the 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 oral pharynx, right, and yeah. the nasal pharynx. It's much more like this, ah, or a high note, right? Mm. But this is still, ooh, ah, it's still in that low yawn position. If it gets pulled up by this, you're in trouble. Yes, That's yes, the because then it becomes really thin. The sound. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because yeah. the larynx is too far up. And if yeah. it goes up, it'll get out of the tilt. And so now the voice gets too chesty. It exactly. gets too pinched. It, is, it becomes heavy all of a sudden. So but it's not I, because of that. It's really because I'm not engaging. Because you're, yeah. you're not disassociating. Yeah. All right. Things, right? Okay, so it great. Get yeah. it, it'll get bright because you have this going on and you have the larynx going up. So the chords are closing harder. Right? So That's exactly how I feel. Yeah. And you're, you're getting a brighter sound. And she's so like, wait, I'm getting a brighter sound. Why is it why is it more heavy? 
Exactly. You know? Yeah. And it's because you're actually thickening the cord rather than keeping it in a longer position. Yeah. You have to disassociate what happens up here from what happens down here. Mm. Yeah. All right. Great. All right. So uh, thank you, Jack. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Pleasure. Yeah. And thanks. Great everybody. conversation. I you think uh, a lot of people showed up around, but um, I, I mean, I won't name it anymore, but uh, thanks everybody for yeah. Thank you. Up and uh, thanks to Jack and, and good luck eh, with uh, everything's going on. I, I hope uh, next year we maybe I can make even a trip to New York to, you know. Yes, I'd love to see you. You know, person, I always you know? love I always love seeing you. I love seeing Vivienne, who is a, 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 a fantastic stage director who we've uh, used and, and has become a staple for Mediterranean Opera Studio and festival for our shows in Sicily. Um, so, yeah, hopefully let's cross our fingers that we actually are able to to find a vaccine uh for this for this uh, you know that scientists uh are blessed to help us develop this and we can get back on our feet and get the arts moving again that would be so great we can hope right yeah of course yeah. <laughs> let's hope things go right all right jack well have right. a good night and now yeah. we're gonna put uh to to just to finish a, a little uh, last excerpt uh, rondine al dido With Jack Livini oh, okay. and um, and David Gallo in the play, in the piano, amazing pianist too. <laughs> David had the, my boss at Covent Garden. He's yes, amazing, amazing, amazing artist and a great coach too. Huh? Great coach. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks, Jack. Hugs. Oh, huh? Take up. care. <laughs> And that was uh, Jack Livigny. Um, uh, just to remind you, everybody, if you, if you like these conversations, this uh, um, follow me on the on the Facebook or follow like Scena Musicale. You also can subscribe to my uh, email list. Um, I I give some little extras there um, musically too when I have concerts and all that. So uh, I think they are there in the chat. The 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 different um, links, the different. Uh, Uh, email addresses and now like I said um, uh, this is La uh, Rondine al Nido with Jack Livigny and, and pianist David Golan thanks to everybody and see you next with uh, I'm gonna have a mezzo-soprano Rehab Chayep mezzo-soprano mo for Montreal alright thank you